Hey guys before watching, please like share and subscribe. Journal of the Emperor, Naruto Namikaze. Entry 1. Since this is the first journal I've decided to keep since being crowned as emperor, this counts as volume 2. Right now, I'm watching Suncher train Maru, Moegi, and Udon. They call themselves the Neo Maru Corps, but Tamari likes to call them Team Misfits. From what I've heard, their pranks in Suna were legendary. Of course, changing Kankaros war paint was pure genius on their part. Tamari told me that Kankaro had his puppets chasing them all through Suna for the three. Three weeks into the training, and from the look of things, Sarutobi, Moegi, and Udon are really getting into their mission. So far, Suncher, Kuda, Okajima, and Chiba have given me nothing but positive reviews in response to their training. Even they seem to be responsive to my taijutsu and chakra training. Tamari even dropped by earlier this week to check up on their training, and even she had to admit that they would make fine chunin for the sand. By the time the Jounin exams come around, they would pass with flying colors. Suncher is a jack of all trades, a master of all weapons. Maru's been learning how to fight with a staff. Moegi likes the tunfas, while Udon prefers to mix it up with short blades, like a pair of kunai or a pair of tantos. When Tamari asked me why Maru chose the staff as a weapon, I explained to her that old man Sarutobi, his grandfather, was an expert with the bow. From the look of things, I got a prodigy on my hands. Not one, but three. Old man, you would be proud. Entry 2. While visiting Gara in Suna. I received word from my network stationed in Lightning Country. The rakage has been overthrown by a more hardline rakage. Even more worse was that the new rakage is backed by Orochimaru. Luckily, the lightning offices of the Pekora House were untouched. The first order of the Godame Rakage was the immediate termination of his predecessor and his brother, Killer B, as they both were considered threats to the Godame's rule. I had the elite guard with me, so after activating the Fox Eye, I activated the Demon's Gate Jutsu. The Demon's Gate Jutsu was something that Kidami and I had developed. Based off my father's Hiroshin Jutsu, I can transport a large number of people with me to any location I deem fit. Seeing as how I visited Kumo when I was first banished, it was not a problem. Once the nausea passed, we headed for A and B's last known location. We reached them in the nick of time, as they were assaulted by the Kumo A and B U. A was injured and B was trying to protect his brother at any costs, his chakra reserves depleted. That's where we came in, and decimated the Kumo A and B U. Thankfully, B and his brother were still alive. Once the bodies were disposed of by fire, I returned to Suna with the Jinchuriki and his brother. Yujito was pretty surprised when I showed up with the deposed Rakage and his brother. I told her to watch over them as I made plans. Once I regained consciousness, I visited them both. A and B were surprised to find out that Yujito was working for me, and they were even more surprised as to who I was. The banished ninja from Kanoha, now Emperor of the West. Not to say that he had a surprise of his own. When I confirmed that Minato Namikaze was my father, they told me that both him and my old man mixed it up in the last Shinobi War. I also said that despite everything, he respected my father a great deal, and that his death was a tragedy. At least I know he wasn't lying to me. After talking a bit more, I gave A and B my offer. Since they are marked men, there was no place safe for them in the elemental countries. So I offered them political asylum within the empire. I had the experience of being a leader. Which would make him perfect for the job of senior advisor, Dam Suncher, turned me down again. As for B, the trading town of Rara needed a new leader. A and B accepted. In a way, it was relieved to be free of the position of rakage, even though it almost got him killed. He had suspected that the council and the most senior ninja were plotting something. I confirmed his suspicious when I told him that the ANBU that were chasing after him had the cursed seal, meaning that Orochimaru had backed the new rakage, or worse, placed a puppet ruler in the leadership role. I relayed the events to all Pekora houses in the elemental countries, telling them to keep alert. Once I has recovered enough to travel, 
we'll head back to Kimen. Entry 3. Right now, I'm at the ruins of the Fire Temple. Chiriku has been killed. I guess I should start from the beginning. Somehow, I got roped into going on an inspection tour of the Pekwar merchant houses in the east with Ruji and Haruka. My elite guards, as well as Team Misfit, accompanied me on this little two-month-long expedition. Well, I would be lying if I said that I was concerned. I still have that banishment order on my head, not to mention the kill on site decree. Damn, I hate Kanoha, which is why I am dressed incognito. The fire capital housed the Pequar merchant house. I realized that the capital was not that far from Chiriku and the temple. I decided to visit Chiriku and pay my respects. Only when I arrived at the temple, I found the place in ruins, most of the monks slaughtered. A surviving monk told me and my envoy the story. Haydn and Kazuku had paid a deadly visit to the temple and leveled the place after killing most of the monks and taking Chiriku's body to the hidden bounty station near the border. My reaction was instant. I told the others to remain at the temple to lend a hand. I retrieved my sword, kunais, seals, and flak vest, but still kept the black kage hat over my face to hide my identity. Swearing a blood oath to avenge Chiriku and to kill the zombie brothers, I took off in pursuit. It took me thirty minutes to reach the border, but I found the underground bounty station. Along with Haydn and Kazuku, the latter watched as Haydn initiated the Jashin ritual and cursed Jutsu on Asuma Sarutobi. My first intention was to let Asuma kill himself trying to stop Haydn, but old man Sarutobi would probably be pissed if I let his son die. So I went with plan B. First, I dealt with Kazuku. Using the chakra chain's Jutsu, I incapacitated him. Then I turned my attention to Haydn. Flashback. Haydn's eyes nearly bulged out of his skull as Naruto impaled him with his kunai. Even Kakuzu was in shock. How was this possible? Haydn was virtually immortal. Now, he was dying at the hands of this newcomer, who had all but virtually killed him with no effort. With a roar, Naruto slid his blade violently to the side, causing Haydn's insides to spill out. The follower of Jashin sank to his knees hands holding his torso in a futile attempt in trying to keep his insides from coming out. Haydn looked into the golden eyes of his soon-to-be killer. How, is this possible? Haydn gasped. I can't fucking, die. Easy, Naruto replied. I simply reverse-engineered the jutsu, which granted your immortality. Not so tough now. Are ya? In the Unification War, Naruto had came across a cult which worshipped Jashin. Like Haydn, their leader was considered to be immortal and was even worshipped as a living god. However, during a raid into one of their strongholds, Naruto found the scrolls detailing not only the jutsu used to make someone immortal, but also the workings of the Jashin ritual and cursed jutsu. With that knowledge, Naruto was able to reverse-engineer the mechanisms of the immortality jutsu. Afterward, the cult was slaughtered to the man. The leader of the Jashin cult was the last to die at Naruto's hands. You think you're the only Jashin follower I killed? Naruto taunted as he drew his sword. How else was I able to reverse the immortality jutsu? As Kakuzu watched helplessly Naruto raised his sword. This is for Chiriku. So lie down and die, the emperor said as he brought the blade down. Asuma watched as the man in black sliced through Haydn's neck before flinging the blood off his blade and sheathing his katana. Upon hearing the audible click, a thin red line appeared around Haydn's throat. Then his head slid forward, falling to the ground and rolling to a stop at his savior's feet. Haydn was dead. The pain finally getting to him, Asuma mercifully passed out. Seeing that Asuma was out of the picture for the moment, Naruto turned to the bound Kakuzu. The bound ninja tried to break free of the chakra chains that bound him, but realized that they were draining his chakra at a rapid pace. One supposed immortal down, one to go, Naruto mused. You may kill me, but the others will track you down and kill you, Kakuzu sneered. They can try. But they will die as well, Naruto replied calmly as he analyzed his opponent. Through his fox eye, he saw Kakuzu's means of immortality, the four hearts. 
One more thing, Kakuzu, Naruto replied as he removed his face mask and hat, I'm Naruto Uzumaki. Kakuzu's eyes went wide. The QB Jinchiriki, you. The last thing Kakuzu saw was a flash of yellow, then darkness. End flashback. Asuma was still out cold. I took Haydn and Kazuku's heads and collected their bounties. But before I could recover Chiriku's body, I received three more uninvited guests. Ino Yamanaka, Shikamaru Nara, and Chuji Akamichi. From the look of things, both Ino and Chuji have been promoted to Chunin since my exile, and they assumed that I was the one who had attacked their sensei. Not surprisingly, they attacked me. They've improved since I was banished, Ino especially. Looks like she's been training under Tsunade, as she now has that chakra-powered super strength. Funny. So do I. After several minutes of fighting, the trio tried to catch me in their famed formation, distract me with Akamichi, then Nara will use his cage mane to capture me and Yamanaka will incapacitate me with their mind transfer jutsu. Well, actually, I allowed them the first two, but when Ino tried to use her family's signature jutsu, I gave them a shocker. I broke free from the cage mane using a jutsu I leaned from General Kazama and performed a substitution with Chuji. Ino's mind went into her partner's instead and I punted Chuji into Ino's body. With both of them out for the count. I turned to Shikamaru. He tried the cage mane again, but this time around, I blasted him with a new technique I developed. Deadly Tempest. I was inspired by Tamari and her Kamitachi attack and after a couple of days, I developed two variants of it wind and fire. The attack is basically chakra-powered winds, with the force of a hurricane gale. The wind variant blasts the opponent with super-cooled air. And it did as it was advertised. Shikamaru was sent flying into his teammates, out cold. With those three nuisances out of the way, I retrieved Chiriku's body. Asuma had recovered by that time, but was in no shape to try and attack me. I left him there with his former students. Kanahagakur, the following day. Inside a hospital room, a very pregnant Kurinai Sarutobi kept a silent vigil over her husband. Haydn had worked Asuma over pretty good with his ritual and cursed jutsu. The Sarutobi clan head had multiple cuts and lacerations, some minor, others serious. He had lost quite a bit of blood on the way back to Kanoha, Chuji had carried him on his back and Ino fed him blood pills, and given the extent of his injuries. He would be on the inactive list for several months. But he would survive. You die on me, Asuma, and I will kick your ass for making me a widow and a single mother, Karina hissed. Inside the Hokage's office. A battered and bruised Shikamaru, Ino, and Chuji gave their report to Tsunade. Also present were the two senior advisors, Koharu and Hanmura, and the warhawk, Danzu. It was only after we had regained consciousness that we saw the bodies of the two Akatsuki, Shikamaru explained, holding an ice pack to his head. The bounty station verified them both as Haydn and Kazuku, both S-class missing ninja, both were members of the Akatsuki. And both were killed by the same man we fought, Ino seconded, also holding an ice pack to her face. Describe this man, Danzu commanded. Tall, maybe about six foot even, Chuji said, holding his own ice pack to his nose. Dressed in black, gown and flak vest, pants and boots. He wore a Kage-style hat to cover his face. He was armed with a sword, but did not use it against us. We saw no Hitayate identifying him as a missing ninja. Hmm. Mercenary. Perhaps? Danzu muttered. Someone who was able to kill two ninja who were deemed immortal is someone to be watched. There's something else, Shikamaru said. Sensei said that the man saved him from being killed by Haydn. I don't buy it, Tsunade said. Whoever this man is, we need to know if he is friend or foe. Bring him in for questioning. Any capable Chunin or Jounin should be up to the task. Dan's about albeit mockingly before he and the two advisors exited the office. Upon going his separate ways from the two advisors, Danzu summoned Sai. He had plans to make. Journal of the Emperor, Naruto Namikaze. Entry 4. 
somehow, I know that beating down the Ino Shikacho trio would come and bite me on the ass. The following day, we held a mass funeral at the ruins of Fire Temple. Chiraku deserved better. He didn't deserve to die like a dog. The surviving monks would rebuild, but not before I promised them help in any way possible. The monks departed to a fallback spot, while I and my entourage returned to the temple. There, I found the warhawk, the one who had orchestrated my banishment in the first place. He wasn't alone. Twenty root ANBU accompanied him. Made me glad that I knew Kanoha law, which is why I gave the order not to kill, but rather maim. Had I ordered the elite guards to kill, then I would be in the bingo book. But I wasn't worried. If I was alone, then yeah, I would be worried. I think I should take this time out to tell you about my elite guards. It was Sanchi's idea, to begin with. Even though I am a highly skilled warrior trained in the ways of the shinobi and samurai, even I need someone to protect me. Which is why Suncher came up with the idea of having an elite group of bodyguards, both samurai and shinobi, to watch my back. They all came from samurai and shinobi families, and are especially good at what they do. The elite guards are a motley bunch, but they look out for each other as well as guard me. The first member just so happens to be the youngest of the bunch. Sunchi's granddaughter, Sana. Like her grandfather, she was trained as a samurai. In the Unification War, she was a member of Yujito's Hellcats, and still wears the khaki flak vest with pride. I spar with her every once in a while, whenever I can't fight her grandfather. The others tend to treat her like the little sister of the bunch. Hideo Kibagami was Eiji's nephew. His parents were killed in battle and he was raised by his foul-mouthed uncle and also taught the ways of the sword. From what I've seen, the Kibagami style is mostly quick draw. He was the oldest of the bunch, and formerly a member of Zabuza's demon squad. Every once in a while, I see him and Zabuza fight. Last time I checked, the matches are 5-4 to four in Zabuza's favor. Takuma Chiba is the resident taijutsu master of the group. I've seen the Chiba clan in action, facing down heavily armed ninja and samurai and they would come out on top. That was one of the reasons why I had him mentor Udon. The others tend to poke fun at his nature, calling him a philosopher with his head in the clouds. But in the moment of truth, there was no one in battle more fierce than a Chiba at your back. Personally, I would like to see him fight either Chuji or Rock Lee. The second oldest of the bunch was Ro Shantu. Both the Okajima and the Shantu ninja clans were natural rivals. Whenever they were not fighting together in the unification wars, they would occasionally try and one-up the other, with often hilarious results. While the Okajima specialized in assassination and stealth, the Shantu prefer to do their business up close and personal. He describes himself as a charismatic sociopath on the battlefield, but a gentleman off it. Hakuyuki Mamachi was chosen by me personally because of her abilities over ice and water. Thought to have been killed during the wave mission years earlier. She was in fact alive alongside Zabuza. In the years following the mission into wave, her abilities over water and ice had all but improved over time, making her even more deadly. Combined that with her taijutsu training from one of the missed refugees, she was very deadly as an assassin. She was also my closet friend, given the life lessons I picked up from her back in wave. Last was the resident medic mean of the group, Akemi Shiratori. The Shiratori and Yamada clans were close allies. When it was clear that Akemi had the potential of becoming a medic mean, Akemi's parents sent her to train under Kokoro personally. Even though she did not have the ability to control fire, Akemi made up for it by being a master medic. Back to the matter at hand. Flashback. Ruins of Fire Temple, Nighttime. Naruto watched silently as the 20 root ANBU surrounded him and his escort. After ordering Team Misfit to back up Ruji, he gave a silent command to his elite guard. The six shinobi and samurai spread out, ready to protect their emperor. The emperor's eyes narrowed as he saw the old warhawk and Sai approach him. In this case, he was thankful that he still had on the Kage-style hat and face mask, which concealed his identity. 
but he had changed out of his flak vest and into his normal vest and long coat. Danza stopped when he was double arm's length, sigh at his side. Naruto looked at the warhawk, then at the twenty root that surrounded him and his escort. Twenty ninja against myself and my escort? Hardly fair, old man. It shouldn't be fair, Danzu replied. You killed two S-class criminals and beaten down three chinin level ninja. I'm simply not taking any chances. In my defense. The three ninja attacked me first. My target was the two Akatsuki. The Kanoha ninja were simply in my way. You didn't come up here for a friendly chat. State your business. Danzu was to the point. You are to surrender at once. By order of the Godame Hokage and the Kanoha Council, you are summoned to Kanoha for questioning. My route are here just to make sure that you make the right choice. Of course, it would be such a shame for a person of your potential to be locked away. I can use someone like you in route. I can protect you from that drunk of a Hokage and the rest of the clans. Join me, and I will make you my right-hand man. When the time comes for me to usurp the position of Hokage, I will make Kanoha a village, to be feared. Join your side and become a tool like the rest of your route. All ninjas are tools. Ninjas are not tools of anyone, Naruto replied. As for your answer, the answer is no. Pity, Danzu replied. Then you leave me no choice. Kill his escort and seize him. As the route moved in, Naruto merely smiled. You really think your ANBU can stand a chance against my guards? You really need to get out more. End flashback. We fought on the grounds of the destroyed temple. Twenty against seven seemed like an unfair fight. Only difference was the people of the West lived and breathed warfare. So Danzu was very surprised when we tore through his route with little effort. I took down ten of them before turning to Danzu and Sai. The ink user found out the hard way that his ink attacks were ineffective against tsunami force winds. Once I was taken care of, I turned to Danzu. The fox eye immediately identified the Echiha Sharingan. Unlike Hitaki, he had several implanted. One in his left eye and the other in his hidden arm. I gotta thank Kidami when I return. The fox I did as it was advertised. Danzu's Sharingans proved to be ineffective against my own bloodline when he tried to use it against me. That didn't make him any less dangerous. I ended up fighting in a sword fight. The old man was good, I hate to admit. But he was pretty complacent in his superiority. But in the end, his sword was broken in two, and he was staring down at the pointy end of my blade. I think he was honestly shocked to see that his best ninja were defeated. Killing him would only make things worse, so I spared his life. Danzu soon joined his route in unconsciousness. By the time he and his group recover, I was be long gone. Entry 5. Visited Yuki in Spring Country. Actually, she invited me to the premiere of her newest movie, which she had shot back west. Afterward, she invited me and the guards to her estate in the Spring Capital. There, I entertained the elite guard with stories of my days as a Kanoha, Genin, particularly the mission into spring, then known as Snow. Now that Yuki's a demio, she managed to get a small ninja village established. She took me there one time. The ninja were mostly refugees from Mist and from other villages that had fallen off the map. I'd say in a few years, the hidden ice village will be a force to be reckoned with. I also received word from the spring branch of the Pakora Merchant House that the original Ino Shikacho trio, consisting of Anoichi Yamanaka, Shikaku Nara, and Chiza Akamichi, were tailing me. This I already knew, since I saw them at the premiere. Chiza pretty much sticks out like a sore thumb, and if he was there. Then his two buddies were not far behind. The original Ino Shikacho were pretty famous during the days of the last Shinobi War. Not as famous as my father but still famous. Call it hubris, but I wanted to see just how good they really were. Fortunately for them, they decided to come to me. It was in the evening when I was training in the woods surrounding Yuki's estate when they showed up. Flashback. Spring Country. 
Clad in his usual black flak vest, pants, and boots, his face still concealed by the Kage-style hat and face mask, Naruto was performing his evening kata. Knowing full well that he was being watched. Yuki was also present, chatting with Sana and Haku, while the other four elite guards stood around, chatting amongst one another. Hiding in the shadows, trying to figure me out isn't going to get you nowhere, Naruto called out in a loud voice as he concluded his kata. Step into the clearing. As the elite guards drew their weapons, Shikaku Nara, Inoichi Yamanaka, and Chiza Akamichi emerged from the forests. The elite guards were ready to attack, but a signal from Naruto stayed their hand. Shikaku Nara, Inoichi Yamanaka, Chiza Akamichi, Kanoha's infamous Inoshikacho trio, Naruto drawled. Yuki's eyes narrowed. Kanoha Ninja? Here? They're here for me, Naruto replied casually. Isn't that right? That's right, Chiza said. Can't help that I'm popular these days. I'm guessing that there's an ulterior motive, you three decide to chase me down, aside the fact that it was on the orders of your Hokage. Inoichi nodded. You did attack our children. So yes, it's a parent thing. You must have parents. So you must understand the bond between a father and their child. I don't, Naruto replied flatly. My parents died on the day I was born, my mother in childbirth, and my father in battle. The father figure I had died in a sneak attack when I was twelve. Enough talk. You came for me, so here I am. You don't have to worry about my guards interfering in our little dance. Pretty confident, are ya? Chiza said as he and his teammates surrounded Naruto. It comes with experience and skill, Naruto replied. I've always wanted to see how the famed Inoshikacho trio can fight. I hope you don't disappoint me. End flashback. The original Inoshikacho proved to a bit tougher than the newer version. But in the end, they too were defeated. After they regained consciousness, Yuki chewed them out before sending them back to the border under guard. So far, it's Kanoha, zero, yours truly, three. Entry six. The elite guards has just went up from six to eight. The two newest members just so happens to be a founding member of the Akatsuki and his lover. Who was the former leader of Amagakure? How did that happen, you ask? Well, as it turned out, my spy network back east had caught wind of a major defection from within their ranks. Male and female, mid to late twenties, the male an expert in gravity and water jutsu, the female a master of paper-style ninjutsu. Yujito and B all voiced their opinions about me tracking down the heads of an organization, consisting of S-class ninja. And believe me, I had my own concerns as well, but having two S-ranked people who know the organization inside and out could prove to be useful. I planned on dealing with the Akatsuki later on, since they are a credible threat and the Akatsuki probably has it in for me for killing two of their members. Well, I'm gonna piss them off even further by rescuing two more. With Kidami as backup, I used the Demon's Gate Jetsu and came across their last known location, Forest Country. Our timing could not have been more perfect, as the two ninja in question were being chased down by a quintet calling themselves the Five Paths of Pain. And from the look of things, these five were very, very deadly. Using my expertise as a tactician, I quickly came up with a plan. Kidami created 200 shadow clones of Haydn to keep the quintet occupied, while Kidami and I went after the two ninja. Both were in bad shape, as the male ninja's final attack had drained the last of his chakra. And it was a pretty nasty gravity based jutsu as well. The Shimmer TCI. While the five Akatsuki were stunned from the attack, I made my move. As the five paths of pain were distracted by Kitami's clones, Kidami, and I grabbed the two injured ninja. The man started to sputter something until I stopped him with just eight words. Come with us if you want to live. By the time Kidami and I returned to the demon's gate, the five paths of pain were still fighting the Haydn clones. When we were safely back west, the clones dispersed, leaving pain to figure out what the hell just happened. Once we were back home, I had both of them treated for their injuries, while at the same time, got their names. The Bluenette was Conan, and her companion was Yahiko. 
Yahiko Uzumaki. And here, I thought I was the last Uzumaki. But it makes me glad that I have surviving clan members to call family. I then found out the reason why they were on the lamb from the Akatsuki. Then again, Yahiko was surprised to find out that my mother was the former ruler of Whirlpool. Originally, they were called the AIM orphans Yahiko, Conan, and another named Nagato. Much to my surprise, they were once students of Jiraiya when they were younger. Yahiko had dreamed of bringing about peace to the shinobi world, and thus created Akatsuki. But over time, the organization had lost sight of their goals, and became corrupt. Yahiko was removed as leader in favor of Nagato. As expected, things got worse. Nagato was the one controlling the Five Paths of Pain, a deadly jutsu which allows Nagato to control five bodies separately via chakra rods and his body via the rods in their bodies at the same time. The studs were placed inside five corpses, reanimating them. The five paths were Animal Path, Human Path, Naraka Path, Azura Path, and Preta Path. Because of Yahiko's talent for gravity jutsu, he would have been number six, the Deva Path. Conan and Yahiko soon discovered that Nagato was just a puppet. The real head of the Akatsuki was Madara Uchiha. Kidami recognized the name, as did I. He was responsible for the events which shaped my life. What Yahiko told me was even more disturbing. Madara desired the power of the tailed beasts, which explained why Itachi and Kisame had chased me. Kidami had filled me in on the backstory. The nine bijou were originally the ten-tailed beast. Its jinchuriki was the six-path sage. Fearing that the ten-tails would be released upon his death, the six-path sage came up with a backup plan. He split the ten-tails into the nine-tailed beasts and sealed the ten-tails' body in a stone prison. Creating the Moon Yahiko and Conan were surprised that Kidami knew about that little piece of information. They were pretty much shocked when they found out that Kidami herself was the nine tails in human form, and that the two tails and eight tails were here. Then they laid out the plan which caused them to flee the Akatsuki. Madara Uchiha Sai of the Moon Plan The plan was simple. It was a plan for total world domination. It also explained Madara's interest in the tailed beasts. The Akatsuki would track down and retrieve the Jinchuriki and use a jutsu to remove the tailed beast from within their bodies, killing the host in the process. So far, they did this to Yugura, meaning that Mei didn't kill him, just simply took control of the mist before it could erupt into civil war. Once Madara had the power of the tailed beasts in his possession, he would fuse them back to their original form and become the Jinchuriki to the Ten Tails. He would then use his eternal Majenku Sharingan powered by the ten tails to project an infant Tsukiyomi onto the moon in order to control any and everyone. And here, I thought Sasuke was bad. Madara's much worse. The following day, I held an emergency meeting of the council. Tamari had sat in. Tarumi was out on retreat in the mountains. I invited Yahiko and Conan to the session and they told everything to the council. Suffice to say, the council was troubled. Only five Jinchuriki were still left. And you can bet your last Ryo that the Akatsuki will be combing the east for them. Gar is well guarded for the time being, so the other four are the problem. I then proposed a strategy. Using the spy network back east, I find the Jinchuriki and offer them asylum here. The motion was passed. As for Conan and Yahiko, I had them placed on probation until the Akatsuki was destroyed. At least Yuhiko and Conan understood the severity of the situation. As they were one former members of the Akatsuki. They had to earn their trust. Entry 8 I received an unexpected guest in my empire today. Kazuma appeared before me while I was going through some paperwork and gave me the news. There was a sound envoy on their way to the Imperial Complex, a group of twenty ninja led by Kabuto. Not one to take any chances. I had Zabuza's Demon Brigade and Yujito's Hellcats on standby just in case things got a bit nasty. Looks like Orochimaru is looking for an alliance, as well as candidates for new bodies, since Sasuke is off-limits. I had Kabuto's escort wait outside the throne room. While I held an audience with Kabuto. Flashback. 
House of Sovereigns, Throne Room. Seated on his throne, Naruto eyed the white-haired man with a combination of disdain and suspicion. Kidami was not there, as he did not want her to give away any suspicion as to her true identity. The Kage-style hat was on his head, effectively hiding his face. Not to take any chances, his face was concealed by his mask. Kabuto Yakushi took a knee, head bowed. Your Imperial Majesty, he began, may your reign be a long and prosperous one. My name is Kabuto Yakushi. I represent Otogekure. The village hidden in the sound. I bring greetings from my master, Lord Orochimaru. Using his chakra to disguise his voice, think Naruto speaking in West Gear's voice, Naruto responded. So what business does your master want with me? Lord Orochimaru has been monitoring the events that have transpired here in the West, with great interest, Kabuto said. He is especially impressed that you have united the lands in so little time. He has sent me here to discuss terms of an alliance between your empire and the sound. Naruto learned back on his throne. Tell me. Yakushi, what would I gain should I ally myself to the sound? You would have the backing of one of the most powerful ninja in the East, Kabuto said. Despite our small numbers, you would mostly benefit from Lord Orochimaru's guidance. In other words, take over my body since Sasuke is off limits, and use my army to invade Kanoha, Naruto thought darkly. The young emperor made it look like he was in deep thought. I am sorry, but a military alliance is not in the empire's best interest. You misunderstood me, your majesty. Kabuto began, but was cut off. Oh. Don't be coy, Yakushi, Naruto replied. Do you really think that you are the first from the east to ask for an alliance? First it was the rock, then it was the cloud, you make number three. The people has seen war since the era of the six paths. Unlike the people of the East, they have not known a lasting peace. I saw the lawlessness of the lands, and I gave them the peace they desired. I am merely a servant of the people, and even an emperor must listen to the will of the people. I am truly sorry that you have come this far. But tell your lord Orochimaru that my answer is no. Kabuto slowly nodded. I see. In any case, lord Orochimaru will be disappointed that you will not agree to the alliance. I thank you for your time, your majesty. With a wave of his hand, Naruto excused Kabuto. As soon as Kabuto was out of the room, General Kazuma of the Shadow Company emerged from, quite literally, the shadows. That went well, Kazuma said. Even better than expected. Have your men tail them, Naruto replied, removing his mask and returning to his normal voice. Make sure that they are on the first boat out of Kimen. I don't trust him, or the snake. Why? What did Orochimaru did to you? Orochimaru killed my mentor, and grandfather to Maru Sarutobi, Hiruzen Sarutobi, Naruto replied as he rose from his throne. Between the snake and Kanoha, I hate Orochimaru more. See to your orders, Kazuma. Kazuma bowed. Right away, my lord. End flashback. I was tempted, honestly tempted to kill Kabuto and declare war on Orochimaru. But I held back. Killing Orochimaru would bring complications that would haunt me later on. Kazuma would later report that Kabuto and his sound envoy had returned back east without incident. Entry 9 Takuma was invited to a martial arts tournament in tea country. So the rest of the elite guards and yours truly went down to tea to support him. Actually, I had to meet up with one of my informants who had information on Mist Country's Jinchiriki, the renegade ninja Yudakata. Plus, Mei was going to be there, so I had to talk to her about giving Yudakata a pardon for going rogue. With the exception of Mei and Gara. Most people here don't know that I am the Emperor of the West. All they knew about the elite guards is that they fought alongside the Emperor, and one of them would be competing in the tournament. I like playing the Enigma. It makes it even more sweeter when those who ridiculed and hated me find out what I've become. Then again, there's IWA and the fact that they hate my father's guts to the point that they would try and go to war against my home. Maybe if I crush the strongest village in the Shinobi lands, then that would make the others fall into line. Nah. 
I want to be remembered for bringing about an everlasting peace, not for starting a shinobi war. If IWA does want a piece of the son of the Yandame, I'd be more than happy to give it to them, on the receiving end of my sword. Sorry, where was I? So I invited Mei to the Pekwara merchant house in Tea Country, to discuss Yudakata. When Mei asked me why, I simply told her the truth. The Akatsuki are looking for them, seeking the power of the tailed beasts. My plan is to simply intercept them to protect them and to give them a home, a place where they can belong. To live their lives in peace. That pretty much cinched it for Mei, so she issued a pardon for Yudakata on the spot. The tournament lasted three days. Takuma Chiba was pretty much the talk of the entire tournament. Before it began, Takuma declared that he was doing this in honor of his emperor. I simply told him do it for yourself, show the East what the Chiba clan can do. At least he's humble and modest to a fault. On the first day of the tournament, I noticed someone in the audience watching me. It was Ten Ten. Who else would wear her hair like that? From the look of things, she was promoted to Jounin. Excusing myself from the guards, I decided to take care of this personally. I left the arena, knowing full well that Ten Ten would soon follow. Flashback. Long coat floating in the wind, Naruto made sure his mask was secured on his face, the Kage style had in place before retrieving a scroll from his coat. Unrolling it and smearing blood on it, the scroll activated, and his sword emerged from the parchment. Naruto picked up the sword by its scabbard, relishing in the weight of the weapon. The weapon was according to Suncher. An Okatana. The Okatana is an older version of the standard katana, designed for somewhat taller samurai so they can use their height to their advantage. Naruto had found the weapon while returning from a successful campaign. While returning to Kimon City, Naruto was traveling through the Laja Mountains, having cinched the northern half's loyalty when he came across a hidden cave. That was where he had found the sword, along with three hundred chests, each filled with golden bricks. The sword was definitely something that caught Naruto's eye. Later, Naruto would swear that he was drawn to the sword. He retrieved it and had his army to retrieve the gold, which would later be used to finance his southern campaign, and to rebuild the war-torn continents once the war was over. Some he gave to his soldiers and clan heads as bonuses and hazard pay, most of it went into the imperial treasury, and Naruto kept the rest. The sword, however, was something that Suncher took an interest in. It had belonged to a powerful warrior, who had forged the weapon from metal retrieved from a falling meteor. The blade itself being razor sharp and indestructible. That was when Suncher had taken Naruto on as his apprentice in the samurai arts. The sword, as Naruto had found out, also had the ability to split into twin swords making it an even more deadlier weapon in his hands. Naruto sensed movement from behind him, and smiled. Ten Ten has arrived. Either you're pretty brave, or pretty reckless to come alone, Naruto said as he turned around, facing his newest opponent. I could say the same for you, Ten Ten replied, sword drawn. You're pretty infamous in Kanoha. So I've heard. You're the fourth encounter I've had with the leaf, Naruto replied, eyeing the Jounin vest she wore underneath, she's in her allied shinobi forces uniform rather than her shippuden outfit. He removed his long coat and placed it to the side before drawing his sword and rested the scabbard alongside a tree. Ten Ten eyed the sword. Now that is a very nice sword. You any good with it? Naruto smiled. I was trained in both the samurai arts and in kenjutsu. So yeah, I'm good with the sword. You may be good, but I'm the best when it comes to weapons, Ten Ten said as she shifted into her stance. Okay, then, Naruto replied as he went into a very basic kendo stance. Let's dance. End flashback. Ten Ten improved. A lot, I must admit. Too bad I was kinda toying with her for most of the battle. So I was feeling a bit sadistic, and I slapped her repeatedly with the flat of the blade, hoping to get a reaction from her. It worked. She got pissed off enough to try the same trick she did with Temari. Can you say, deja vu? I think Temari would be laughing her ass off when she found out that I blasted 1010 with deadly tempest. 
but I was at least nice enough to drop Ten Ten off at the local hospital instead of leaving her there in the forest. Entry 10. Rock Lee and Niji Huga showed up the following day. Both had been promoted to Jounin, it seems. While Niji looked after Ten Ten, it was up to old Bushy Brows to uphold the honor of Teen Guy. In the meantime, Takuma had breezed through the tournament. The only opponent that gave him a problem was the Taijutsu expert from IWA. Needless to say, Chiba's opponent was very pissed when he lost. So much so that he tried to ambush Takuma with myself and the other elite guards present after the second day. No, we didn't kill them, just sent them to the hospital with a wide assortment of broken bones and cuts, just to show that we were the wrong people to pick a fight with. It was after the second day of the tournament that Rock Lee showed up. Flashback. Tea Country, Evening. The elite guards were at the local restaurant while Naruto decided to take a walk along a grove. The emperor was dressed down in his standard uniform that he wore during the Unification Wars, the same uniform that he had on when he killed Haydn and Kazuku, but with one major difference. Rather than the Kage-style hat, he switched to a bandana. The face mask remained on his face. Naruto knew that Rock Lee was tailing him. That was a given. But he had given him the slip when he entered the grove, so now the roles were reversed. Naruto was tracking him. Heh. Looks like Mr. Youthful is now a Jounin as well, Naruto thought as he noticed the Jounin vest on rock. Still can do better than that crappy spandex. Deciding that this little game has gone on long enough, Naruto decided to confront his former comrade. Rock Lee. One third of Team Guy. Second Green Beast of Kanoha. It's a honor. Rock Lee spun around and saw Naruto leaning up against a tree, hands in his pockets, shoulders slumped. From the look of things, he was alone. And you, you've attacked several teammates and comrades from the leaf. That is most unyouthful. In my defense, they initiated combat when they challenged me, Naruto replied, standing straight up. I was merely defending myself. You've been making a name for yourself, Rock Lee said, slowly sizing up his opponent. Despite all of that, you did save Captain Sarutobi. I'll take that into consideration when I take you in. You can try, Naruto replied. But, it won't be that easy for you. I hear you're a genius in taijutsu. I'm an expert in the style myself. He shifted into his stance, think Kenzuya's fighting stance. So come on, green beast. Show me your stuff. That cinched it for Rock Lee. Y-O-S-H. You are indeed a worthy opponent. He went into his Gukan stance. This will be my most youthful performance yet. I wouldn't hold my breath on that, Naruto thought darkly. End flashback. I took Bushy Brows to the brink in our little battle. He ended up opening three lotus gates and removing his weights. I decided to unleash a brand new taijutsu technique that I've been working on. The Shadow Dancer. Similar to my classic Uzumaki formation and combo, only difference was instead of using my clones to attack, I used chakra-powered speed and power to smack Lee repeatedly. Kidami was right about thing, you can't dodge what you can't see. With the defeat of both Ten Ten and Rock Lee, it was only a matter of time before Niji would appear. And given the fact that the pompous little shit threatened me with death should I return, I had a serious bone to pick with him. Entry 11 Takuma had won the tournament. Big surprise. At least the others were entertained. Not to mention they won a pile of Rio for betting on Chiba. As Takuma fought, I felt the killer intent radiating in my direction. At the opposite end of the stadium was Niji himself. His bicogon was activated, and he was glaring at me. Sorry, Huga, but you won't see any red chakra in me. I freed Kidami but no one from Kanoha doesn't know about that little tidbit just yet. Following the ceremony in which Takuma was crowned, Niji made his move. He called me out on the stadium's Let Die. Snafu's notes, the Let Die is a training platform. The best example of this is from Mortal Kombat, Deadly Alliance intro in which Shang Tsung and Quan Chi double-team Liu Kong. Flashback. 
Niji Hyuga stared impassively at the disguised Naruto. The same man that had killed to S-ranked criminals, belonging to the most infamous organization of missing ninja, we well as bested several clan heads and high-ranking Chinin and Jounin, his teammates included. It was while he was at the hospital looking after Ten Ten that Rock Lee was brought in. He had fought the man in black and had lost. That, to Niji, was impossible. Rock Lee was the same as him, a prodigy. Despite losing to the man in black, Rock Lee was in good spirits. He may have lost the battle, but the man in black had earned his respect. It was during the awards ceremony that Niji had crushed the ceremony, issuing his challenge to the emperor. You deserve praise for making it this far, Niji began. But your luck ends here. As it is fate for me to be a member of the branch family of the Hyuga, fate as deemed me as the winner. I will defeat you and bring you back to Kanoha. Naruto frowned. Niji had never gotten over that crap about fate. Then again, he said the same thing when he was banished. I never got this far by living my life bound to fate. Fate and honor are designed for one thing. They are designed by weak people to keep the strong in line. There is no such thing as fate. There is only choice. The choice to do what is right. The choice to make your own destiny. Niji's eyes were alight with anger as he activated his Baikagan. You lie. No one can change their fate. There was one who said the same thing, but he turned out to be a demon in disguise. You will see soon enough. I will show you why I am considered the best in the Hyuga clan. Oh that's it, Naruto thought. If the beatdown I gave him back during the Chinin exams was bad, I'm gonna do worse here. Sighing, the former Kanoha ninja, cracked his knuckles. At first, I was just going to fight you. Now, I'm gonna kick your ass. To his elite guards and the judges, he barked out, leave us. He is mine. As the elite guards and the judges piled off the lay die. Bets were being taken. Niji was well known in the east for his skills in taijutsu, but he had never faced off against a revamped Naruto. This time, his chakra system wasn't messed up like last time. He was going to rip Niji a new one. End flashback. Niji knew only one taijutsu style. I know too. And since the shadow dancer technique was so nice, I did it twice. When Niji attempted the 64 palms, I let loose with the shadow dancer. And just to be a total ass, each time I hit him, I struck his chakra points. Yeah, I admit it. I was a total jerkass when we fought. I had seen the Jiken in action many times back in Kanoha, when I was chased by the villagers, I was on the receiving end of it by some unruly Hyuga asshole who had too much to drink and wanted to take it out on the Kyuubi brat. As he slipped into unconsciousness, I left him with a parting shot, you claimed to be the best, but you fell like the rest. Entry 12. No one from Kanoha attacking me today. Good thing too. Something else did happen, though, despite me being on the tail end of this inspection tour. I heard reports of IWA having not one, but two Jinchiriki. Both former IWA ninja who had resigned and decided to wander. It took me a while, but my spy network came through. The ninja in question were Rashi and Han, Jinchiriki, to the four-tailed monkey and five-tailed dolphin horse respectively. The bad news was that they were both being pursued by the Akatsuki. But even bad news can be a blessing in disguise. Since I was already on the Akatsuki's radar by eliminating both Haydn and Kazuku, I tracked both of them down, as they were injured from their battle with Deidara and another member, some guy calling himself Toby, and retrieved them both. An impressive feat, seeing as how I did it all alone. I guess it helped that I ambushed the both of them with a Senjutsu-powered, deadly tempest, then I used a shadow clone to retrieve the two men. IWA was out of the question, since Oniki would more than likely force them back into service, so I returned to Tea Country, where I used the Demon's Gate Jutsu to return back to the West. At least the inspection tour was over. There, Han and Rashi had regained consciousness inside the guest quarters of the Imperial Palace. Yujito and B were there to greet them when they woke up. 
After making sure that they were fed, I summoned them to the House of Sovereigns. Flashback House of Sovereigns, Imperial Complex Rather than meet the two Jinchuriki inside his throne room, Naruto had them led to his office, where he was just finishing up the pile of paperwork detailing the condition of his empire. Kidami was with him. The humanized form of the Ninetales was scanning a document when Yujito led Rashi and Han inside the office. Almost immediately, Yanbi and Gobi went nuts. Kidami saw the looks on their faces and knew what that meant. Rashi Former ninja of Awagakure no Sato, Jinchuriki of Yanbi, the four-tailed monkey. Han Also a former ninja of the same village, Jinchuriki of Gobi, the five-tailed dolphin horse. And you're the Ninetales, Rashi guessed. Kidami smiled. How insightful of you. Yes, I am Kubi no Yoku, but my human name is Kidami Akashiya. Han, in the meantime, was looking at Naruto with an odd look in his eyes. Has anyone ever told you? Naruto cut him off. That I look a lot like Minato Namikaze? I get that a lot, seeing as how he was my father. Han narrowed his eyes. Didn't know he had a kid. You know he's well hated in IWA. For his actions in the last Shinobi War, I know, Naruto replied. The only Kanoha ninja in the bingo book with a fleonside order. I heard rumors that a kid unified the lands here, Rashi said. Never thought it would be Minato's son. That would make you the Emperor of the West. It was you that saved the both of us? Naruto nodded. Yes, on all counts. Take a seat. I'll tell you the entire story of how I ended up here. It took Naruto ten minutes, but he laid it all down. From his childhood to being banished in the aftermath of the Sasuke retrieval mission, to uniting the country under his rule. Even Rashi and Han were shocked to find out that he was banished not only for being the container of the Nine Tails, but for simply doing his job. The kid is telling the truth, Gobi concurred. As crazy as this sounds, he's telling the truth. He is not lying, Yambi seconded. Han leaned back in his seat. Attacking a child for something not in his control. Such a disgrace. Banished for doing your job. If anything, the Echiha should have been the one banished. Rashi nodded. Indeed. And the council's been blocking your progress, despite your devotion to the leaf? Naruto nodded. He then changed the subject. Have you ever heard of the Akatsuki? The two men nodded. The Akatsuki are gathering the Jinchuriki for something big, Naruto explained. My spies have been sending me reports about their motives. Does the name Madara Uchiha ring a bell? Both men nodded. Naruto explained that Madara was the mastermind behind Akatsuki. And that he wanted the power of the tailed beasts for his Eye of the Moon scheme, of which Naruto had explained to both men. So far, Naruto had remained one step ahead of the organization of S-ranked missing ninja. His interference in their attempts to capture Rashi and Han was another wrench tossed in the gears. So you saved us from the Akatsuki? Rashi asked. Yup, Naruto nodded. In this case, the Jinchuriki should be united against the Akatsuki. They sent Itachi Uchiha and Kisame Hashigaki to capture me when I was younger. They both failed. I rescued Yujito from them and offered B and his brother sanctuary within the empire. The people know about my past and do not see me as a demon or a monster. They even seen Kidami in her true form and did not run away. What are you offering? Han asked. Sanctuary within the empire, Naruto said. Protection from the Akatsuki and all your enemies. You can settle anywhere you wish. Even become a leader of a village. But the time will come where we must take a stand against the Akatsuki. And what do you want in return? Han asked. Your loyalty. That's all I ask. If you wish to return back east, then I will not stop you. What do you say? Seeing as how they had nothing left for them back east, they chose to stay. Okay, Lord Namikaze, Rashi said. I accept your offer. I would like to wander around a bit, 
get my bearings straight. Naruto nodded. Of course. He then turned to Han. What about you? I'm more at home in the mountains, Han replied. There's several mountain villages in the Laja Mountains north of here, Naruto explained. Demio Tadu said she needed some help in one of the villages. Said that their village elder had passed away and they need a new leader. Are you up to the task, Han? Han nodded. Naruto smiled. Good. Welcome to the Western Empire. End flashback. Entry 13. Han and Rashi fit in pretty well. Well actually, Rashi has taken to wander in the southern region, hanging around in either South Ichiyama or Tears Point, while Han made his home in the mountain town of Yuto. When I visited Demio to do, she was happy to say that Han had taken his role as protector very well. Of course, I had to see for myself. But after making a trip to the village, I saw it for myself. Rashi had told me that Han had a chip on his shoulder the size of the Hokage monument over how he was treated. Can't say I really blame him, since it was the same with me back in Kanoha. I can honestly say that Han had found the peace he had long sought. Even Rashi had to agree when he came to visit his partner. The kids like him, even calling him the giant, as it was clear that he was the tallest man in the village, if not the entire empire. I could have sworn that one of the ladies was making eyes at him, oh well. Not my business to pry into other people's affairs. As long as they are happy, then I know I did a good job. In the meantime, I think it would be best that I would hang around here for a while. Let things die down. Maybe Kanoha would forget about me. Then again, Kanoha never let certain things go. I can expect another run-in with my past soon enough. Entry 14. Today, I stuck it to the Akatsuki yet again. I found out that two teams of the Akatsuki were looking for Yudakata. I met the guy back when I was younger, so I knew what he looked like, as well as how he fought. As for the teams of Akatsuki, they were Itachi and his partner and the five paths of pain. Kidami used a shadow clone and placed it under a henge to make it look like Yudakata and send it to distract pain, while three of the elite guards, Kidami, and I went after the real one. Yudakata was currently engaged in combat with Itachi and Kisame. We simply waited until Itachi and his partner had beaten down Yudakata before we made our move. Flashback Near the lightning border Fire release, deadly tempest Itachi and Kisame leapt back from the deadly blast of superheated air, which had reduced several trees to instant ash, the unconscious Yudakata slung over the traitorous Uchiha's shoulder. In an instant, Kisame had Samahata out, ready to shred any and everything. Since Naruto didn't have time to change out of his usual attire, i.e., vest, long coat, pants, and boots, he only had on the black hat. This time, he went without his face mask. The emperor had his sword drawn. You have my thanks. Yudakata is pretty hard to find, he said, looking at Itachi. But this is where I come in. Yudakata is coming with me. Drop the jinchuriki and step back. The Akatsuki has been looking for him for quite some time, Itachi replied. This has nothing to do with you. Leave. Can't do that, Itachi Echiha. Drop the jinchuriki, or there will be trouble. At that, Kisame attacked. Holding the bandaged sword high, he charged. Imagine the shark man's shock when Naruto merely knocked Samahata out of his hands with his okatana, right before kicking it into a tree. After decking the renegade mist swordsman, he turned to Itachi. Now that your partner is out of the way. Itachi cut him off by saying one word. Tsukiyomi, he deadpanned, his Sharingan morphing into the Majenkyu as he stared right into Naruto's eyes. If anything, Naruto's golden eyes showed amusement. Itachi was surprised to see that his technique didn't work. Meanwhile, Kisame had retrieved Samahata and was back at Itachi's side. Even he was shocked to see that the Majenkyu was ineffective. Nice try, Uchiha, Naruto remarked dryly. Your Manjenkyu is no match for my bloodline, if I can be so modest. Not only it increases the power of my jutsu and seals to rival the power of the legendary sages. 
It also makes me immune from all forms of Jinjutsu, including your dreaded Tsukiyomi. His grip on his sword tightened. This can end in two ways. And in both of them, the Rokubi Jinchuriki comes with me. You make it sound like we have no choice, the fallen Uchiha replied. You don't, Naruto said as he prepared for battle. It's my way, or, ah, uh, screw it, it's my way. End flashback. It was a two-on-one match between yours, truly, and the two Akatsuki. Kidami and the elite guard had retrieved Yuta Kata and his student. A woman named Hitaru, who had came across the battle. Anyone would have been crazy to take on two S-class missing ninja by themselves, but then again, I'm not your average warrior. Kisame was easy to dispatch. Oh, did I forgot to mention that my sword was indestructible, and almost hacked Samahata into pieces? That forced the sword to absorb Kisame's chakra, which drained him to the point where I could easily drop him. Then I fought Itachi. Hard to believe that he murdered his clan, just to test his skills. No wonder Sasuke was so screwed in the head. Since his Sharingan proved to be ineffective against me, Itachi went for his ANBU-issued katana. Now this was starting to get very interesting. I guess I should mention that my sword has a real interesting technique. It can split in two. The look on Itachi's face was priceless. After five minutes of swordplay, Itachi unleashed Amaterasu. The black flames did a pretty damn good job of scorching the trees, as well as hiding my Hiroshin. I ended the battle by wrapping Itachi up with chakra chains. Sheathing my sword, I saw that the elite guards had left the scene with my prize. Turning to Itachi, I left him with a parting shot. Your life is your still, Itachi Uchiha. But the next time we meet, you will die. As I turned from the two Akatsuki, I stopped and turned around. Hiding in the brush were three ninja. Two were living hives, while the other had chakra, which reminded me of old man Sarutobi. Asuma Sarutobi, and the Aburame, Shibi, and Shino. I looked dead at Asuma, and wondered if I should pick a fight with the old man's son and the two Aburame. I decided against it and left the scene, leaving two unconscious Akatsuki and three bewildered Kanoha ninja. The clone that Kidami had used to distract the five paths of pain vanished, its job done. Back west, Yudakata regained consciousness the following day. There, I told him everything about the Akatsuki's motives and my own plans in dealing with them. Yudakata was surprised, who wasn't, when he found out that I was now the emperor, but he was no fool. A chance of a fresh start with his student was too much to pass up. He agreed to my offer of sanctuary within the empire. Kanahigakur no Sato, the following day. Upon their return to the village, Asuma Sarutobi, along with Shibi and Shino Aburame headed straight to the Hokage Tower to deliver their report. Asuma had been released from the hospital the previous week, and was assigned patrol duty so he could get back into the niche of things. Instead, he and the two Aburame stumbled upon Itachi and Kisame near the lightning border and witnessed a confrontation with the man in black over Yudakata. Only the shinobi half of the Kanoha council was present, as Tsunade had ordered the civilian half to leave. As she was getting tired of their rampant stupidity, especially from Asana Haruno, the civilian council wanted to place Jiraiya inside the bingo book as an S-ranked missing ninja, but Tsunade had refused. When they did it regardless, placing the Toad Sage as an S-ranked criminal with a retrieve on-site order, the fire Demio was furious. Tsunade had suspended the civilian side of the council for a month without pay, while the Fire Lord reduced Kanoha's military aid by half and sent their B and A-ranked assignments to Wind Country for the next year. Jiraiya was no traitor. As the Toad Sage was in contact with the fire Demio himself, and was granted immunity after leaving Kanoha. Suffice to say, Jiraiya was taken out of the bingo book almost immediately. Even Danzu was against the council's move, which was surprising to most people. After all, Jiraiya was more useful alive instead of dead. Tsunade and the shinobi half of the council listened to the report with great interest of the confrontation with the man in black and the Akatsuki. Also present was Sasuke Uchiha, recently promoted to Jounin. It was through his hard work, not because of his name. 
that Tsunade finally relented and allowed him to take the Jounin exams. But Sasuke knew that Tsunade despised him for his role, which led to Naruto being banished. Sasuke was also interested in the man in black. He has, after all, came out victorious against the best Kanoha had to offer. Now, he fought his brother and his partner and had soundly defeated them in battle. So it's true, Tsunade said. The Akatsuki are gathering the Jinchuriki. She only hoped that Naruto was safe. Jiraiya was no help, since he has deprived the leaf his spy network. That can prove to be a problem for the Akatsuki, Shikaku Nara pointed out. Yujitoni, the container for the two tails has disappeared following Uzumaki's banishment. And just recently, Han and Rashi have also vanished. The Akatsuki did not intercept them. If anything, I'm willing to bet that the man in black has something to do with those incidents. Sasuke winced. Uzumaki. He still blamed himself for his attempted defection. Naruto was banished for simply doing his job and bringing him back. He kept his distance from Kakashi and Sakura. Kakashi had pretty much abandoned Naruto, while Sakura still called for his death behind Tsunade's back. In the months following Naruto's banishment, even he saw that things had went bad for the leaf, despite what the civilian council had said. Kanoha had lost every single trade agreement and alliance it has forged because of his former teammate and has become a virtual pariah in the shinobi community. Irika Yumino was dead, having committed suicide in the months following Naruto's banishment. Like the others, he had forsaken Naruto in his time of need. It was Sasuke who had found his body, having slit his wrists with a kunai, unable to live with the guilt of betraying Naruto. Sasuke covered up the suicide in his official report, claiming that Irika had simply lost the will to live. He was buried in the Kanoha graveyard. Only Tsunade knew the truth. Irika had left behind a suicide note. All it said was I'm sorry. He deserved better. We do not deserve his forgiveness. We all abandoned him in his darkest hour. On Tsunade's orders, Sasuke incinerated the suicide note. Tucci and Ayam's business were hit hard in the following months. When confronted by Asana Haruno, they refused to recant and declare Naruto a demon, the civilian council, led by Haruno had virtually boycotted their ramen shop. In retaliation, Tucci and Ayam closed down and moved to Wave Country, where the people welcomed them with open arms. Sasuke had heard that Ichirakus was doing a lot better than it did back when it was in Kanoha. The man in black has proven to be a worthy adversary, Asuma continued. We also gained some new information regarding him. Such as? Chiza Akamichi prodded. He has a bloodline, Shino said. He didn't say its name, but gave a detailed description as to what it can do. Captain Sarutobi stated in his report in regards to the confrontation with Haydn and Kazuku that Haydn's immortality was nullified with his seals. It's the most logical conclusion that the man is a top-notch seal master, of which he verified when he fought Itachi Uchiha and Kisame Hashigaki. He said that not only his bloodline boosts the seal's effectiveness, Asuma continued, but casting Jinjutsu on him would not work. As his bloodline makes him immune, as Itachi failed to pull him into Tsukiyomi. It also nullifies the Sharingan's ability to copy Jutsu. Lastly, his bloodline also allows him to cast Senjutsu level Jutsu. No wonder why my Sharingan didn't work, Danza thought, remembering the confrontation at the ruins of Chiraku's temple. But this boy is proving to be even more interesting every time I hear about him. I was careless the last time. He is a perfect candidate for being Kanoha's ultimate weapon. Next time I see him, I will take him down. After defeating both Uchiha and his partner, he started to leave with his entourage, but he stopped and looked right at me, Asuma noted. His face, did you see his face? Kohara demanded. Asuma shook his head. No. Not his face. I saw his eyes. They were the color of pure gold. Then he turned and walked away. He had what he came for, so fighting us would have been moot. The bloodline could have something to do with his eyes, Shibi said. But that is just an estimated guess at best. Lady Hokage, this is very unnerving news, Hanmura said. 
We should place this man in the bingo book as a A-ranked criminal with orders to retrieve on sight. Whoever this man is, he has not killed any Kanoha ninja, the Godame replied. And you know the law, Mito Kato. Unless a Kanoha ninja dies at his hands, then we cannot place him in the bingo book. I honestly think that the civilian council's stupidity is rubbing off on you and Koharu. Ignoring the blubbering advisors, Tsunade continued. My order still stands. Find him and bring him in. I don't care if you have to use diplomacy or brute force. At that, Tsumanazuka smiled. After seeing the failed attempts of both generations of the Inoshikacho trio, Team Guy and Danzu's rude ANBU, the feral clan head was itching for a chance to fight the mystery man. It had been a while since the elite Jounin had a good match, and she felt that the mystery man could give it to her. Deserted Village of Yugakure, Hot Water Country Inside a deserted bathhouse, Naruto cursed to himself for the sixth time that morning as he received the memories of the clone he had left at the hot water capital. The new hot water Damiyu had sold him out to the squad of Kanoha ninja that were heading this way in exchange for a hefty reward. Among the six-man squad of Jounin level ANBU Black Ops, they were being led by Kakashi Hitaki and backed up by the Inazuka matriarch and her son. Naruto was in hot water country with his elite guard for an overnight stay before heading over to spring country. He was smart enough not to trust the cocky young Damiyu, who had ascended to the position following the death of his father. Naruto had passed through the hot water capital with his elite guards and had decided to check out the former ninja village of Yugakure, Haydn's former village. The village had become a tourist town, forcing Haydn to leave. When Haydn returned after joining Akatsuki, he had Kazuku in tow. Together, they put the entire village to the sword. Only five survivors had escaped the village, and Yugakure was abandoned. The local people said that the city was cursed by the insane Jashin priest slash ninja. Now, Naruto was hiding out, waiting for the arrival of his former sensei and the two Inazuka. He had ordered the elite guard to keep the ANBU occupied while he dealt with Kakashi and the Inazuka. Naruto did not forget their reactions to his banishment. He did not forget the cold indifference of his former sensei, or the death threats that were directed to him from the Inazukas. And he wasn't in a forgiving mood. His spy network inside Fire Country had proven their worth. Not that he already knew how the Kanoha Eleven fought but that he kept up with his former teammates' progress ever since he established the Pekora Merchant House in Fire Country. The emperor had changed out of his casual attire and into his standard battle gear, mesh shirt, black combat pants, and boots. His black flak vest was the last item he regarded for a moment. Black like the sound flak vests, but it was similar in design, like Kanoha, only there was no whirlpool spiral on the back. It was his favorite. He slipped it on and checked his items for the upcoming battle. Scrolls, check. Standard kunai, check. Sword, check. The second clone that he had placed at the village gates had dispersed, Naruto gaining its knowledge. They were here. Placing his face mask over his face and his bandana over his hair, Naruto secured the sword over his shoulder and stepped outside to face his former sensei and the Inazuka. At the entrance, the massive one-eyed dog with the missing ear sniffed the air. He is close. Very close. Suma Nezuka gave her pet a pat on the head. Good, Karamaru. Kiba Inazuka gave Akamaru a pat on the head to soothe its whining. I know boy. I know. This place freaks me out too. The team from Kanoha were in a neighboring village when they received word from one of the hot water Damiyu's minions. The man they were looking for was in the capital, but was now headed in the direction of Yugakure. Several miles out from the city, the three Jounin and their ten-man team of ANBU Black Ops had encountered the man in Black's bodyguards. While the ANBU kept the bodyguards occupied, the Inazuka and Kakashi headed for the deserted village, where they quarry awaited their arrival. After seeing their fellow ninja brought back empty-handed, Sum had been itching for a chance to take on the man in Black. When word reached the Kanoha ninja that the mystery man was in the vicinity, the special Jounin immediately jumped at the chance. 
Kakashi, along with her son, who was also in training for becoming a special jounin, had tagged along. So this is Yugakure, Sum quipped as the trio of jounins walked through the gate. Haydn's hometown, right? Kakashi nodded. It was, until the village went from a hidden ninja village to a hidden springs resort. Haydn didn't take it very well and left. When he returned, he was a follower of Jashin and had Kazuku with him. What those two had done had made the Echiha massacre look like a backyard brawl. Out of a village of over 300, only five survived. I can see why our friend chose this village. The locals believe that it's cursed. Sum snorted. Superstitious fools. Pretty smart for him to have his bodyguards keep the ANBU occupied. Divide, then conquer, Kiba seconded. I can see why the others lost to him. They didn't have a special jounin and a master of the Sharingan along with them, Sum said. The others were careless. This is not a game, Inazuka, Kakashi pointed out. We have our orders. We have to bring him in for questioning. Sum started to reply to that before she spied movement. There, she shouted as she and Kiba charged forward, only to have Kakashi restrain the both of them. Could be a trap, he said. Raising his Hatai 8, exposing his Sharingan. He created five shadow clones and sent them off in the last known direction of the person Sum saw running into what used to be the village's inn. Watching from his perch several buildings away, Naruto shook his head. All too predictable, Hataki, he muttered to himself as the five clones chased after his own shadow clone. A shadow clone loaded down with explosive tags. Five, four, three, two, one, and... Naruto covered his ears. Boom! The blast threw the three ninja off their feet, while the two dogs threw themselves to the ground. Naruto chuckled softly. It was time to get reacquainted with his former sensei and the Inazuka. I really hate being right, Kakashi thought. The son of Sakumo Hataki rose to his feet, as did Tsum and Kiba. You two okay? Tsum nodded. Yeah. Kiba grunted in response. Looks like you called it right, Hataki. It was a trap. Kakashi looked forward. And there he is. Sum looked forward. Kiba did the same, as Kuramaru and Akamaru growled. Stepping through the fire, like a demon out of hell, was Naruto. Kakashi looked upon his opponent. Little did he know that the man in black was his former student, the same one he had written off as worthless years earlier when he was banished. Sum and Kiba were elated. Here was the man in black, the same person who had killed Haydn and Kazuku and had gone through Danzu and his route, both generations of the Inoshikacho trio, held his own against Itachi and Kisame, and had beaten down Team Guy. Naruto cracked his knuckles, which was followed by him rotating his neck muscles. He was primed and ready to deliver some much-needed payback upon these three. You did this to your teammate? You are worse than trash. You are scum. My mom was right about you. You're nothing but a damn demon. I'll kill you the next time I see you again. This time around, his chakra control wasn't screwed up like it was during the Chinon exams. It was time for some get even. Kiba looked at the disguised Naruto. This is what got Kanoha riled up? He doesn't look like much. Don't underestimate him, Kiba, Kakashi warned. He is labeled as an S ranked ninja. Sum smiled. Oh, this was going to be fun. Naruto watched as Kiba performed the Inazuka's signature jutsu. Beast ninja jutsu, four legs, Kiba shouted. Had Naruto did have his mask on, Kakashi would have seen the evil smirk on his face as Kiba crouched down on all fours, his already feral features becoming even more feral, his chakra radiating from their bodies. Naruto wondered why Sum wasn't going feral alongside her son. Then it hit him. She was sizing him up, along with Kakashi. So. Naruto began, his eyes the color of pure gold, been looking for me? Akamaru, stay back. He's mine. Kiba shouted as he charged. Naruto shifted his body to the side as Kiba reappeared, 
his elbow, striking nothing but air. You missed, Kiba Inazuka, Naruto deadpanned. Kiba blinked. You know me? That one distraction cost the male Inazuka, as he did not see Naruto's fist on a course for his chin. It was a full-body swing too, came out of Kanoha from where he was born, hooked a right through the ninja academy, picked up even more speed through the chinin exams, and was forged in the fires of the unification wars. Crunch. Kakashi winced as the uppercut from hell, caught Kiba square in the chin and launched the feral boy in the air and backwards. He landed on his back and slid to a stop in front of his dog, Tsum, Karamaru, and Kakashi. Kiba shook off the blow, but even he had to admit that it hurt like hell. Naruto chuckled darkly. This reminded him of the first time he had fought the Inazuka during the Chinin exams, when Kiba knocked him on his ass. Kiba tasted blood. He spat it on the ground. First time in a while since someone made me bleed, Kiba said as he retrieved two familiar looking pills. Looks like the rumors were right about you, but it's not enough. Akamaru. The dog barked as Kiba tossed one of the pills in his mouth, while he swallowed his own. When Akamaru's fur turned red, Naruto knew what was going to happen. Tsum smiled as her son performed the beast, clone jutsu. It's over. Kiba has won. Kakashi did not share in Tsum's optimism as Akamaru transformed into a clone of Kiba. You can stop the macho act. The real Kiba began. And give up, the false Kiba finished. You're finished. You think that, wouldn't you? Naruto replied. Defeat me first, then boast. Until then, less talking, more fighting. Both Kibas charged. Much to their surprise, Naruto charged in as well, leaving only an afterimage of him standing before. Much to Tsum and Kakashi's surprise, Naruto was holding his own against Kiba and Akamaru. Amazing, Kakashi muttered as he tracked the action with his Sharingan. Rock Lee said that this guy's taijutsu was flawless. He's keeping up with Kiba. Even more interesting is that he's not using his chakra to do it. Tsum growled. She had taught her son better than this. Meanwhile, Naruto was calmly blocking, dodging, and weaving through the two Kiba's attacks. Let's see if I can provoke him into doing the Gatsuga, Naruto thought. His fox I knew which Kiba was the real one and which was Akamaru, tagging both of them with several blows of his own, enraging the dog lover when he failed to strike him. Ducking underneath their punches, Naruto knocked them both back with a power punch to the breastplate. Then he grabbed a handful of Kiba's flak vest, pulled him in and began to punch him in the face several times before let go of the dog ninja and ducked, just as the Kiba clone pounced, crashing into the real Kiba instead. Pitiful, Naruto sneered. Kiba growled. He had not laid a single blow on this guy and he was moving just as fast. On top of that, his eye was swollen shut from the guy's rapid fire style of punches. Pulling a smoke bomb out of his pouch, he had the false Akamaru keep him occupied when he flung the bomb at Naruto's feet. Upon hearing the coughing and hacking, Kiba saw that his much needed opening had appeared. Akamaru, now! Kiba shouted as they both charged into the smoke, spinning into the Inazuka signature technique. Getsuga! Wham! When the smoke cleared, both Kiba and Akamaru, who had reverted back into his original form, stood proud and tall over the still FORM of the man in black. Heh, Kiba breathed. Told you, that you already lost. Sim let out a whoop of joy. That's my boy. You showed him what the Inazuka could do. Her and Kiba's elation was short-lived, as the body of the man in black vanished in a poof of smoke. Kakashi spied movement from above and looked up. Kiba! Watch out! Kakashi shouted, pointing upwards. Kiba looked up, just in time to see Naruto sailing at him as he finished off several seals. Wind release, deadly tempest. Kiba didn't know what hit him. All he felt was a blast of super-cooled air that struck him with the force of a stampeding bull, which... All too easy, Naruto replied as he rose to his full height. Impressive, Kakashi thought. When Kiba threw that smoke pellet, he used a shadow clone while he escaped. 
I barely registered him jumping into the air. He masked his chakra while at the same time using it to escape the Gatsuga. His mastery of battle tactics is on par with the Nara. And that Jutsu. Tsum shook her head. Kiba, you idiot. As Akamara reverted back to its original form, Kiba said one thing before losing consciousness. Mama, I hurt. Kuramaru, ready? Tsum asked as she rose to her height. As always, Kuramaru replied. My son may be Jounin, but he still has a lot to learn, Tsum said. She then activated the beast mimicry. Followed by the beast clone, transforming Kuramaru into a clone of herself. I am the matriarch of the Inazuka clan, special Jounin Tsum Inazuka. You have proven to be a worthy adversary in your encounters with my fellow ninja. But it ends here. Then show me, Tsum Inazuka, Naruto replied as he went into another stance, think Gukan's stance from SSF4. Show me what a special Jounin can do. There was no arrogance in his voice. His tone was casual, borderline cordial. It then dawned on Kakashi. He was toying with them. Tsum, stop. Too late. Tsum and Kuramaru charged. Claws outstretched, the two Tsums attacked. This time around, she didn't make it easy for Naruto. The emperor took one step back in order to keep Tsum from clawing his face off, allowing the Tsum clone to catch him with a dropkick to the chest, causing him to stumble. Capitalizing on her advantage, Tsum pressed on the assault, succeeding in tearing a gash in Naruto's flak vest. I'll tear you apart piece by piece, if I have to, Tsum snarled. Trust me. It won't come to that, Naruto replied, right before unleashing his own counterattack. Tsum felt the air rush out of her lungs when Naruto punched her hard in the stomach, followed by an elbow to the gut. The Tsum clone got a knee to the chin when it tried to sneak attack from behind. It was at that moment that Kakashi realized that Kiba was gone. Tsuga. Crunch. Kiba had struck from behind when Naruto was distracted by Tsum. The impact of the blow had sent Naruto crashing through a wall. Catch me off guard, will he? Kiba said as he took a knee, the Tsuga taking a lot out of him. Never underestimate the Inazuka clan. Tsum smirked as Kurama reverted back to his usual form. Sorry, Hataki. Looks like you get to sit this one out. The honor of capturing the man in black is ours. Kuramaru, Akamaru, retrieve our prey. Kuramaru and Akamaru barked in response and rushed in after Naruto. Kakashi could not shake off the feeling of dread that was creeping in his gut. That was too easy. Unless. His fears were verified when the unmistakable sound of a trap were sprung, the victims being the two dogs of the Inazuka. Naruto stepped out of the hole he had made, looking worse for the wear but still able to fight. His flak vest and mesh shirt were shredded from Kiba's tsuga. That hurt, almost, he said as he discarded the shirt and vest, leaving him naked from the waist up. Kakashi took notice of the numerous scars on his chest and torso, think the smaller scars Kanzuya has on his body, a sign of a battle-hardened warrior. Where's Akamaru and Kuramaru? Tsum demanded. I didn't kill them, Naruto replied. They're incapacitated, but alive. You were holding back all this time. The way Kakashi had said it was as if he was stating a fact. Of course, Naruto replied as he prepared himself for the upcoming assault. No matter how random things are, I always have a plan. And half of that plan has been executed by removing those walking fur coats out of the equation. The second half is simply beating you three down. Assuming his fighting stance he said, so, who wants to dance? Shut up. You talk too much. Kiba shouted as he charged. Kiba. Wait, both Kakashi and Tsum shouted. Too late. Kiba's hot-headedness had cost him. Crunch. Naruto's fist had broken Kiba's nose. As Kiba screamed in pain. Naruto swung his other fist with chakra-backed strength catching Kiba on the jaw. The sickening crack that followed had verified that Kiba's jaw was broken. The male in Azuka was sent flying before falling into a heap on the ground. Kiba! 
Psum screamed. Naruto smirked evilly. Kiba was just too predictable. One and Azuka down. One to go. This time, Kakashi joined the enraged Inazuka clan head in attacking the emperor, Kakashi armed himself with a pair of kunai. This time around, Naruto had stopped holding back. Summoning a chakra chain and stiffening it so that he could wield it as a staff, Naruto went on the attack. He slapped the kunai out of Kakashi's hands and swept him off his feet, the older man was forced to roll out of the way when the emperor attempted a leaping overhead strike, causing him to miss. Psum attempted a tsuga of her own, but Naruto used the chain as a pole vault, propelling himself into the air, just as Psum spun past him. When she landed, she felt the chain-like staff strike her on the back of her skull, leaving her stunned. Kakashi tried to attack Naruto from behind, only to find himself in a reverse armbar, and getting his face punched in repeatedly, as did Kiba before him, right before throwing him towards Tsum. The Inazuka matriarch jumped over Kakashi and went on the attack. Naruto's fist bounced off her head, followed by the punch to her breastplate, which despite the flak vest, still hurt like crap. The roundhouse kick to the side of her head sent her spinning to the ground. Kakashi retrieved his kunai and lunged forward, but Naruto elbowed him in the face. Grabbed a handful of his hair and with one blow, ruptured his left eye socket. Twisting his former sensei's body so that he was bent and facing the ground, Naruto slammed his knee into his face before grabbing his jaw and flung him away. Psum recovered and caught Naruto, raking her nails across his torso. Naruto simply ignored the pain and continued to fight. Ducking under a claw swipe to the face, Naruto punched Tsum's torso with twenty blows in the space of three seconds, full wed by a right cross which busted her lip, and a kick to the chest, knocking her back. Naruto turned to Kakashi, who was just finishing up a long string of seals. Now what? Naruto thought as he looked at Kakashi, who was standing next to a lake. Monkey, bird, young water, rat, boar, bird. His eyes widened as he recognized the jutsu, as it was also used by Zabuza and Haku. Oh, crap. Water release, water dragon bullet. Kakashi shouted. Naruto's reaction was instant. When the massive water dragon reached its apex, Naruto began his own set of hand seals. One thing about Naruto was his uncanny talent for battle tactics, which was honed during his years of fighting in the Unification Wars. As Kakashi and Sum watched, Naruto countered Kakashi's jutsu with his own, just as the water dragon duff for him. Fire release, deadly tempest. Naruto bellowed. The vortex of superheated air crashed into the water dragon, cancelling the other out. It also had the effect of blanketing the entire area with steam. He knows fire jutsu as well? Kakashi wondered as he felt Tsum back up to him. Damn it. Asuma and the Aburame called it right. His eyes are blocking the Sharingan's ability to copy his jutsu. Where is he? Tsum demanded. I can't see anything. We have to wait until the steam clears. Naruto, in the meantime, could see everything. Deciding to incapacitate Sum first, he created a shadow clone to get her attention. The decoy worked, and Sum went after it, ignoring Kakashi's yells for her to stop. Tsuga. Sum screamed as she drilled through the steam, striking the decoy in the back. Had she been paying attention, she would have saw that it was a clone. Once she landed, Naruto struck with brutal efficiency. Psum spun around, and threw one clawed hand at Naruto, only to have the younger man grab her wrist. When she tried to attack him with her other hand, he did the same. Cocking his head back, Naruto smashed his skull into Tsum's face, breaking the cartilage in her face, before letting her go. Interlocking his hands together, he delivered an upward hammer blow which knocked her into the air, before slamming her back to the ground with a downward hammer blow. Sum felt his foot in her back. Then she felt the two punches mid-torso, which was followed by the elbow into her shoulder, which broke her collarbone. Kakashi heard the scream from the Inazuka matriarch and rushed to her last location. There, he found her, whimpering, holding her shoulder with her remaining hand, blood flowing freely from her nose. She would be of no use now. 
By that time, the steam had cleared. Kakashi was alone. Sum and Kiba were both down. All that remained was him and Naruto. Naruto faced down his former sensei. All the memories of him favoring Sasuke over him came flooding back in an instant. The wave mission, in which he and the Banshee were ordered to practice tree climbing and chakra control while he trained his precious Echiha. The Chinin exams, in which he had told Naruto that he was training Sasuke and not him. And that day when he was banished for simply doing his job, and Kakashi was one of many who had condemned him. So what Sasuke had been returned battered and bruised. The life of a ninja was full of risks. Kakashi didn't blink when he noticed the Chidori wound in his shoulder. Can't use the Sharingan, Kakashi thought, hoping that his only memento of Abido was not damaged. Kiba and Sum are down. I'm gonna have to use the Chidori when I get the chance. That was all Kakashi could think before Naruto was upon him. The AMBU captain could do nothing but block as his, unknown to him, former enraged student unleashed nearly three years of pent-up frustration and anger upon him. Kakashi coughed up blood as he felt several of his ribs break from the onslaught. The man in black was unwavering in his assault upon him. Even more worse, whenever Kakashi tried to counterattack, it was as if the man in black was reading his every move, his counterstrikes were indeed brutal. In desperation, Kakashi performed a substitution, appearing behind Naruto while he had punched out a log that took Kakashi's place. Chidori Naruto wasn't going to fall for that again. Imperial style, flash step, he whispered. Naruto had derived the flash step from the Hiroshin. He already can move just as fast as Lee without the weights. But using chakra to boost his agility, he found he could move fast to the point that he would leave an afterimage without the signature yellow flash. Something that Kakashi had found out the hard way, as he realized way too late that Naruto was behind him. With a yell, Naruto nailed Kakashi with his final attack. Boot. Jaya. Naruto's revised version of the Thousand Years of Pain had met its mark and sent Kakashi flying. The Jounin landed hard on his right side when he was sent crashing through a tree, the impact breaking his right arm and leg. Kakashi whimpered as he tried to get to his feet, but to no avail. Finally, Kakashi lost consciousness. Naruto took a moment to get himself under control. Looking around, he saw that all three, Kanoha Jounin were out cold, but alive. When Yahiko and the rest of the elite guards had showed up after blowing past the ANBU, they found Naruto crouched over Kakashi. The reason being, Naruto remembered Kakashi having one of his father's Hiroshin kunai in his possession. Said kunai was now in Naruto's hand, having pilfered it from Kakashi's effects. You of all people don't deserve this, Naruto said as he pocketed the kunai. You, Kakashi Hitaki abandoned me in favor of the Echiha. I am not the scum you once proclaimed me to be. You are. Boss. Are you all right? Yahiko asked. Naruto nodded. I'll live. Let me grab my things. It seems that hot water country is not worthy of having a peck or a branch here. It's time for us to leave. Once Naruto had gotten his belongings, he performed the Demon's Gate Jutsu. By the time the second squad of ANBU had arrived, all they found were two dogs in a net. And three broken, Kanoha Jounin. Kanoha Hospital, Kanahigakur, two days later. While taking their daughter for a routine checkup, Asuma and Kurinai Saratobi decided to check in on Tsuma Inazuka. The Inazuka matriarch was in her son's room. Tsum's arm was in a sling, her collarbone reset, as was her nose, as the bandage over that was any proof. Kiba was out cold. His jaw having to be rewired, his nose also reset. Akamaru and Karamaru, who were on the ground resting, raised their heads, but calmed down once they saw that it was the Sarutobi clan head and his wife. Asuma knew the Inazuka clan head for many years, as did Karinai, since they both were on the same team together back when they were younger, and despite everything, they remained friends. When Kiba had told Tsum that Karinai was his Jounin instructor, she approved of the decision. So how is he? Kurinai asked of her former pupil while Asuma petted both Kuramaru and Akamaru. 
Not as better off as me, Sim replied, subdued, gesturing to her sling. The Godame had to rewire his mouth shut. Looks like we'll both be out of action for the next couple of months in order to heal. So what happened? We received word from the new Damiyu in hot water country, Sum began. Said that the man in black was in the area, heading for Yugakure. Kiba, Kakashi, and I were close by. We waited for a backup of ANBU to show up, before we gave chase. The man's bodyguards intercepted us, and the ANBU held them, allowing us to continue on. We found a Yugakure, and this is the result. Asuma winced. Ouch. Looks like you three pissed our friend off. Soom chuckled bitterly. You should see Hitaki. He had the worst of it. Twelve broken ribs, and both his right arm and leg broken. But that's not the worst of it. From what the Godame has told me, not only will he be out of action for close to six months, but he won't be able to sit right for the next couple of weeks. Just what did he do to him? Karina asked. Remember that joke jutsu that Kakashi likes to do? Asuma knew what Tsum was talking about. The thousand years of pain. What about it? Looks like our friend did it to Kakashi, and he didn't use his fingers. He used his boot instead. Asuma winced. Ouch. Really hate to be him. Talk about the final indignity. Journal of the Emperor, Naruto Uzumaki Namikaze. Entry, 15. I was visiting the Imperial Consulate in Mist when at Yuhiko's suggestion, I decided to check out the ruins of my mother's home village. I was surprised that the Whirlpool ruins were located in the far end of Wave Country. Wave Country was at least a few hours' travel by boat from here, and it has been a while since I visited the old drunk and his family. And Yuhiko did have an interesting point. I was always intrigued about the Whirlpool village from what he told me, so I decided to head for Wave once my business with Mist was completed. Who knows, I may find some of my mon's jutsu there. Whirlpool was known for its seal masters. Mom was part of the ruling class which ran both the village and the island, while Yahiko's family was the military arm of the village, kinda like the Echihas military police before Itachi went nuts. It was because of their mastery over seals that IWA had declared war and razed the town to the ground. Another reason to hate IWA. Arriving in Wave. I saw that the people have prospered since Gata was killed. Venturing into the town, I stopped when I saw a most welcoming sight. Ichiraku's ramen. Here in Wave. They had upgraded from a ramen stand to a small restaurant. Now it's Ichiraku's ramen, bar, and grill. Say what you want about me, I still love ramen. So before heading over to Tazuma's home, I dropped by. Sure enough, working the kitchen, were Tuchi and I am. I may hate Kanoha, but these two were one of the very few that did not see me as the Fox Reborn. For that, I will always be eternally grateful to them. They told me how they refused to see me as the Fox, and that Haruno's mother organized a boycott of their business. In retaliation, they simply closed down and moved to Wave, where they called themselves a Chiraku's Ramen, Bar, and Grill. I am also told me some bad news. Irika was dead. Tsunade had said that it was a suicide, that he felt an enormous amount of guilt for supporting the villagers in my banishment. The Echiha had found the body. As I stayed overnight at the Inn of the Waves, I broke down and cried. I cried for Irika. Even though he sided with the civilians. He did not deserve his fate. The following morning, after breakfast, I spoke with Tazuma and the Council of Wave. After an hour of chatting and setting up a trade alliance, thus establishing the Wave branch of the Pakora Merchant House, it was off to Whirlpool, but not before leaving a clone in the town under a hench to make sure nothing funny happens while I was away. We arrived in the Whirlpool ruins mid-afternoon. Afterwards, we began to search the ruins of anything useful, jutsu, relics, anything. Following Ahiko's directions, I came across the estate of my mother. It was still fairly intact. There, I found the mother load. Mostly wind jutsu, including a very interesting item, a scroll detailing how to make chakra wind blades, designed in similar fashion to the raisin shuriken. 
oh, this could be quite useful. Yahiko found some water jutsu and a couple of swords inside his ancestral home. I've seen him fight with the sword, and he is very impressive. So all in all, this little expedition turned out to be a success. Then, I felt the clone disperse and I gained its knowledge. Kanoa Ninja were closing in, and fast, consisting of Maido Gai. That psycho instructor from the Chinin exams, Enko Midarashi, and Hayashi Huga. I warned the others that we will soon have company, and told Yahiko and Conan not to kill them. Zero body count, maximum ego damage. Yahiko could get into that, as did Conan. So with the others properly warned, we continued our search into the ruins. We didn't have to wait long for the Kanoha ninja to arrive. They surrounded us. Anko was busy giving Takuma the once-over. I think she likes him or something. Hayashi must have heard me and the others talking while we searched the village. He respected the fact that I had noble blood, given my relationship to the former ruling family of Whirlpool, but I wonder how he would take it if I told him that my mother was Kashina Uzumaki, wife to Minato Namikes? Then Hayashi made a big mistake. When Enko questioned him as to why Hinata was not here, he said that the reason why she was not here was that she was weak, a stain on the family name. Once Hanabai made Chinin, he would arrange a marriage to Hinata to be married off to some nobleman so that the clan could gain more influence and power. I think that's what pretty much set me off, since I punched Hayashi, imitating the battle. While the elite guards fought the ANBU, I summoned two clones, while having the fox eye active. The two clones turned into virtual doppelgangers of Anko and Guy, and attacked, while I dealt with the arrogant Huga clan head. Hayashi was harder than Niji, so I knew that I was going to be in for one rough night. But I had the advantage of knowing how the Jukin style works, as well as intimate knowledge of how the chakra circulation system works. So I countered Hayashi's attacks and struck him in his tenketsu points. Then I just beat the holy hell out of him for insulting Hinata. The clone that was fighting Anko was almost out of chakra, so I had to make this quick. Hayashi was already defeated, on his knees, looking defiant, but after insulting Hinata, I had to get some payback. You would think he learned after seeing the end result of Niji, insulting her back during the Chinin exams. The flaw of your own power is arrogance, I said. Then I punched his forehead four times. When he will come to, he will have the word jerk punched into his forehead. With Hayashi out of the way, I turned my attention to Anko, who had finally succeeded in destroying the clone. She didn't see me coming. One punch to the head, followed by me closing off her tenketsu points, and she was down for the count. Takuma was holding his own against Mado Guy, until I told him to stand down and lead the older man to me. Takuma did a good job of delaying the boisterous Jounin, but he was mine. I haven't forgotten him and Asuma booting me out of town, and I wanted to show him what I can do. Ironically, he met the same fate as did his pupil, the Shadow Dancer. So let's see, I fought the Inoshikacho trio, then Kanoha sent out the original Inoshikacho trio. The one-eyed Warhawk and twenty of his root, Team Guy, Hataki, and the Inazuka, and now, the crazy snake Jounin, Guy, and the pompous Huga clan head. All had failed. Kanahagakur no Sato, several days later. Tsunade's voice rang throughout the village. You did what? Asana Haruno sniffed as she ignored the furious looks of the shinobi side of the council, while the civilians looked smug. We voted to reactivate Sasuke Uchiha as an active ninja. As of this moment, his house arrest has been lifted. Tsunade was furious. I did not agree to this. Only I can lift his punishment. If it's any consolation, most of the shinobi half voted against it, Asana replied, but the vote-breaker came from Lord Huga himself. Whether you like it or not, Sasuke Uchiha is now an active ninja of Kanoha once again. Tsunade growled. Fine. Just to make sure he does not run off to Orochimaru, I will add a stipulation to this decision. I will assign Captain Hitaki and Captain Midarashi to his detail. If the Echiha attempts to run to Orochimaru, if he even farts in Odo's general direction, he will be immediately executed. You can't do that. Asana shouted. 
I just did, Tsunade replied, radiating killer intent over the council. It's high time that you civilians remember who is running the show. This is a shinobi village, and no civilian should have no say in shinobi matters. This has gone on long enough. You seem to forget yourself, Senju, Asano replied with a smirk. We can just as easily remove you from office. We have the wealthy and the men of quality in our ranks. And I have an army of pissed off, underpaid shinobi, Tsunade countered, slowly rising from her seat. Glaring daggers at the arrogant Haruno, her voice rising in anger. An army of pissed off, underpaid shinobi, who blame you and the civilian council for the mess that we are currently in. An army of pissed off, underpaid and potentially munitious shinobi that at my command, will roast and eat your men of quality in the ashes of the town square. I will say this only once. Cross me again, and the Echiha massacre will look like a village dance, compared to what I will do. Furthermore, the civilian council and Hayashi Hyuga are immediately suspended for the rest of the month without pay. Get the hell out of my sight. It was true. Ever since the fire Damiyu had had the financial aid following their attempt to make Jiraiya a missing ninja, the civilian clans have been living high off the hog while the ninja were resentful of the docked pay brought on by the civilian council's stupidity. Even Danzu, who orchestrated Naruto's banishment, was furious over the council's arrogance. The village teetered on the edge of civil war. All thanks to the civilian council. A civil war that the shinobi force can win hands down. And if the fire lord decided to get involved, he would easily side with the shinobi. So peace, as shaky as it was, managed to continue inside the leaf. On the shinobi side of the council, the shinobi watched on with shocked looks as Asana, Hayashi, and the civilians hurried out of the chambers. Even Koharu and Hanmura were shocked to see this side of Tsunade. Despite having taken part in Naruto's banishment, they were on the side of the shinobi council this time around. And thankful that they voted against reinstating Sasuke. You were right, Shikaku, Chiza said. Women can be scary. Given the choice of dealing with Tsunade or my wife and Tsum, I'll go with the latter, the lazy Nara said. Very troublesome. From the Journal of Naruto Azuamki Namakase. Entry, 16. The six months are over. Right now, I'm in Suna, having been personally invited by Gara for the duration of the Chinan exams. The elite guards are staying at the Imperial Consulate, while I am at the Kazakage Tower. The Chinan exams in Suna were done in the same fashion as they were done back in Kanoha. Only this time, instead of the Forest of Death, Gara had used a deserted part of Suna for the scroll ret rival assignment. I had faith in Team Misfits. Although I really can't call them that anymore. But Maru, Moegi, and Udon kept the nickname as a badge of honor. Suncher, Okajima, Yamada, and Chiba had trained them well. I had heard that they also breezed through the written exam in record time. But I knew that another confrontation with the Kanoha ninja would soon be inevitable. Flashback After witnessing the confrontation between Hinata and the Kanoha ninja, Naruto departed for the Imperial Consulate. While walking through a side street, he met up with Yahiko and Conan. After explaining his intentions regarding Hinata, he asked Conan to tail Hinata for the next two days in order to get her schedule down. Once that was done, he would use one of the Imperial Courier Ninjas to summon Hinata to the Imperial Consulate. With the presence of the Kanoha Ninja, as well as that of the IWA Ninja, Naruto had to once again go incognito as he was clad in his long coat, vest and boots, his Kage-style hat and face mask. Walking down a side street, Naruto, Conan and Yahiko headed in the direction of the Kazakage Tower to meet with Gara. The ruler of Suna was very interested in meeting with the former Akatsuki founder and his lover, and Naruto was taking the both of them to him for a quick sit-down. So far, with the exception of Gara himself, Fu and Yugura, the remaining Jinchuriki were safe in his empire, and the Akatsuki were none the wiser. Naruto stopped in mid-step. Yahiko and Conan also stopped. What is it? Yahiko asked. We're not alone, Naruto calmly replied as he turned around, as did his two bodyguards. 
Almost immediately, Yahiko drew out his swords, while Conan had her paper shurikens in between her fingers. Behind him were Kurina Yuhi, Sakura Haruno, Kiba Inazuka, Kakashi Hitaki, Enko Midarashi, and Ten Ten. Kiba had not forgotten the crushing defeat that he had given him and was ready to attack. However, as Naruto calmly used a scroll to summon his sword, he relented. Kiba. You can't fight him here. Stepping in between the Inazuka and his giant dog was the one person that Naruto wasn't expecting to see. Clad in the standard Jounin uniform with the Echiha crest on the sleeves, hiltless katana over one shoulder, and Kanoha Hitaite on his head, was Sasuke Echiha. Naruto felt his emotions rising, but immediately suppressed them. If Sasuke was here, then that means Kanoha was getting incredibly desperate in trying to bring him in. Naruto chuckled inwardly. Unknown to his former teammates and sensei, Cell 7 was back again. Only this time, they were on opposing sides. I already met Itachi, you must be Sasuke Echiha, Naruto remarked, dryly. What do you want with me? You fought against the Kanoha elite, Sasuke replied calmly. You even killed two S-class criminals and held your own against my brother. I want you to fight me. Naruto considered this very carefully. This could earn him the closure he needed to close the book on Kanoha once and for all. Oh, if he could only be there when Sasuke tells them that the man that they were chasing is the Emperor of the West. But Naruto wondered how Kanoha would take it if they found out that the Emperor was the former container to the Nine Tails. I accept your challenge, Uchiha, Naruto replied. But not here. Once the Chinin tournament is completed, we will fight in the Suna arena. Kakashi raised an eyebrow. Will Gara allow it? Naruto smiled meanly. Once I speak to him, he will. I hope you can give me a better challenge than your brother. Then you are a coward, Sakura sneered. If you were a real man, then you would fight Sasuke now. When I want your opinion, you pink-haired freak, I will ask for it, Naruto replied. Until then, you can reattach your lips to the Echiha's ass, fangirl. Something inside Sakura snapped. With a yell, she charged, fist cocked back, ready to fly. Sakura! Stop, the three senior Jounin shouted, but to no avail. Naruto simply stood his ground as Sakura threw her punch. Predictable as always, Haruno, he thought as he stopped her punch with one finger. Then he used a palm strike to the torso to knock Sakura back to Kakashi. With Sakura dealt with, Naruto turned to Sasuke. You have three days to prepare, Uchiha, as he turned on his heel and walked off, Conan and Yahiko trailing behind. End flashback. After that confrontation, I made my way to the Kazakage Tower and after Gara had talked with Conan and Yahiko, told him of the challenge the Echiha has thrown to me. And that I wished to fight him inside the Suna Arena once the Chunin exams are over. Gara didn't have no love for Sasuke and agreed to my offer. I retreated to the Imperial Consulate to not only prepare for the match, but to also make plans in contacting Hinata. Entry 18 Took me two days, but I contacted Hinata. Right now, she is asleep, safe inside the Imperial Consulate. Her father had placed that damned seal on her, the same one that Niji had and shoved her inside the branch family when she lost to Hanabai. I cemented Hinata's loyalty when I not only removed it, but also told her that I was the Emperor of the West. Right now, Maru is the last member of Team Misfit to make it to the finals. Moegi and Udon ended up fighting one another. That match ended in a double knockout. Despite that, those three had made me proud. Gara has taken me to the side and told me that he was very impressed with the results of their training, and despite how things may end, he will promote them to Chunin. I also received another shock. The last of the Jinchuriki was waiting for me inside the Imperial Consulate, wishing for an audience with me. I remembered her from my days as a Kanoha Genin. Fu, the Jinchuriki, of the Nanabai. She had heard about me retrieving the other containers and granting them asylum from the Akatsuki. Fearing the organization of S-class criminals, her village had chosen to exile her. When he found out that I was in Suna, she sought me out. 
that was a first. But it did save me the trouble of tracking her down. We talked inside the Imperial Consulate. When I revealed my true identity to her, Fu was very surprised to see me again. I welcomed Fu into the ranks of the Empire. Promising to take her with me once the Chinon exams are completed. Entry 19 Maru faced off against Hanabai Huga in the final match the following day. Hayashi was in the audience. Gara told me that my little stunt with Hinata has left him pissed off, as he had the main branch ninja Komsuna looking for Hinata. But she was safely tucked away inside the Imperial Consulate. Several of them had picked a fight with the consulate's guards when they tried to enter the consulate and were soundly trounced. When Gara threatened Ed to place the Hugas into his sand coffins, they finally backed off. As for the final match, it kinda mirrored my match with Niji back in Kanoha. Only difference was that Hanabi wasn't sprouting that fate bullshit, but she was acting like her shit didn't stink. Typical Hyuga superiority complex. But what she didn't know was that I taught Maru how to counter the Jukin style when it became clear to me that he was going to fight her. Or the fact that Maru had signed his grandfather's summoning scroll and summoned the Monkey King, and used its staff form to soundly trounce her. Hanabi never stood a chance. Hanabi was knocked out cold. When I appeared on the stadium grounds, applauding Maru and congratulating him on his victory, I think Hayashi found out that I was one of his trainers. He had came to Suna to see his heiress clean house, and as Hanada had told me, to show her just how worthless she was when Hanabi had won. I think Hayashi was furious to the point that old man Sarutobi's grandson had trounced his precious heiress. He got a boot to the head for his troubles when he tried to attack me once again. Good thing I was dressed for battle, since Sasuke appeared. I ushered Maru out of the way as I faced down my former teammate. If I was angry when I fought Hitaki, I was absolutely furious with the team. Hinata had filled me in that he was pardoned by the civilian council, placing the blame on both me and that Hiki Orochimaru gave him, but Tsunade had him placed under house arrest, which was later lifted by the civilian council in order for him to come and face me in Suna. The Shinobi Council and the majority of the Shinobi don't trust him ever since his attempted defection, whereas Sakura still worships the ground he walks on. Gara himself gave the order to begin. Sasuke has improved during my absence, but I had fought and trained long and hard over the years. That title of emperor wasn't just for show. But honestly, out of all of the Kanoha ninja I had fought, Sasuke was the toughest. We fought for at least 30 minutes, until I finally gained the upper hand. Before I knocked him out, I told Sasuke that I was the Emperor of the West. Maybe now that would get Kanoha off my back. After the match, I returned to the Imperial Consulate, and waited for the town to clear of the visiting ninja. Once they were gone, I said my goodbyes to Gara and used the Demon's Gate Jutsu to return to Kimon City, with Hinata, and the last of the Jinchuriki. Sunshur was right. I had to face my demons and to free myself of my past. Beating down the Kanoha elite pretty much did it for me. Now, I feel as if a huge weight has been lifted off of my shoulders. I can finally focus on the future of my empire. I can focus on Hanada. Kanahagakur no Sato, following the conclusion of the Chinon exams. The civilian council had placed all their hopes on Sasuke hoping that the Echiha elite could defeat the man in black and bring him to Kanoha, after the mystery man had given the leaf black eye after black eye after black eye. Their hopes were dashed when they saw the ninja that were sent to Suna return, without the man in black. Despite his injuries, Sasuke had a report to make. Ignoring the guards at the gate, Sasuke and Kakashi headed for the Hokage Tower. Inside the council chambers. What? This time, the outburst didn't come from Tsunade. It came from Asana Haruno. Even the shinobi side of the council was very concerned at the change in events. Sasuke had just told them the identity of the mystery man. Several high-ranking jounin also sat in on this meeting, as they were curious as to who the mystery man was. I said he is the emperor of the Western Empire, the Echiha, confirmed. He told me before knocking me out. The Kazakage had all but confirmed it. On the shinobi side, shock was the evident reaction, 
while disbelief reigned on the shinobi side. Even the normally arrogant Danzu was shocked. The mystery man was the infamous emperor that has been making waves back in the West. This definitely complicates things, Asuma said. This one agrees, Sum seconded. At least I feel a whole lot better about losing. Troublesome, Shikaku muttered. Very troublesome. We almost pissed off the Western Empire by attempting to kidnap their ruler. Inochi and Chiza, who were seated next to their teammate, also agreed. Danzu was thinking along the same lines. From what I managed to get out of Gara, Sasuke continued, he is accompanied by his elite guard. Eight chosen warriors, whose main objective is to protect the emperor from any and all threats. So what was the emperor doing in Suna, of all places? Asana demanded. He seems to be pretty chummy with the Godame Kazakage, Kakashi said. We noticed an imperial consulate in the city. Garas also mentioned that he had sent Sarutobi and his team to personally train under the emperor himself. Given their performance in the Chinan exams, the emperor has succeeded. I have to admit that those three cleaned house. Asuma smiled at that. Had Maru stayed in Kanoha, he would have made a fine Chinan. It could be a trick, Asana shot out. As much as I would like to believe Captain Hitaki and Jounin Uchiha, we need more proof. Those merchant houses that has surfaced, the Pequar merchant house, they came from the west. Tsunade knew what Asana's intentions were. There's a traveling merchant from the Pequar house in the market. I will summon her to appear before the council. The merchant in question was a former, special Jounin level Kunoichi named Maki Asahina. Following the Unification War, she had left her unit at the age of 27 and had signed on to the Western Empire's Intelligence Division, which ultimately led her to the East, her assignment being Fire County. Her cover was that of a Kunoichi turned traveling merchant working for the Pequor Merchant House's Fire Country branch, located within the Imperial Consulate inside the Fire Capital. Tsunade found it strange that the Emperor had refused to allow a Fire Consulate inside his empire. She also had a paltry bounty of 25 million Rio placed on her head, given her role in killing a group of bandits who had tried to raid the Pequor merchant caravan while on the road to the fire capital. Twice a week, she and her entourage of Pequor merchants would travel to Kanoha. She was also loyal to her emperor to the point that she nearly blew her cover when she ended up arriving on the anniversary of Naruto's banishment. Fortunately, her co-workers had managed to calm her down. So imagine her surprise while packing up the stand and preparing for the trip back to the fire capital, she was summoned to the Hokage Tower by three members of the ANBU to face the Kanoha Council. Tsunade looked at the former Kunoichi, easily identified by her crimson flak vest and her ninjato, which was strapped to her back. Maki looked back at her with a bored, yet curious expression. The slug sage cleared her throat. First off, thank you for coming to this meeting. You are not in trouble of any kind. We just have some questions we would like to ask of you. Maki shrugged her shoulders. Shoot. First off, what's your name? Tsunade asked. Maki Asahina. Former captain of the Imperial Defense Forces, 3rd Battalion, 7th Division, 1st Squad. Now, I'm a merchant with the Pekora Merchant House, Maki replied. A merchant, yet you are armed and wear the flak vest of a ninja, Koharu pointed out. I wear this as a badge of honor. To remind myself that even though I am a merchant, I will always be a ninja, Maki replied. The katana is for merely self-defense. The shinobi could respect that, Danzu included. An ANBU handed her the picture of the disguised Naruto. Can you identify this man? Tsunade asked. Of course, Maki replied. That's his imperial majesty, the crimson fury of the empire. In other words, he is the emperor of the west. Whispers and murmurs were heard throughout the council chambers. Does he have a name? Danzu asked. He does, but I am under orders not to say it. The emperor has many enemies, and there are those in the East who wish to make a name for themselves by eliminating his imperial majesty and take his throne. 
His clan is virtually the richest out of all of the clans in the West. That was understandable to the gathered shinobi. That's not good enough, Asana Haruno snapped. Tell us his name. Maki turned to the civilian council member. You don't like that? Tough shit. I answer to the emperor, not you. How dare you? Asana shouted, rising to her feet. You will tell us the name of the emperor, or else you will pay a visit to Ibiki. Haruno, sit down, Tsunade ordered. Leave it to the hot-headed Haruno, to antagonize their guest. But. Asana sputtered. Shut up and sit down, the Godame bellowed, the sheer will alone made Asana collapse into her seat. Once Asana was properly humbled, Tsunade turned back to Maki. I apologize, for Representative Haruno's behavior. Apology accepted, Lady Hokage, Maki replied. I take it you want to know more about the boss? The boss? Tsunade repeated. It's a nickname we have for the emperor, Maki explained. It goes back during the days of the Unification War. To answer your question, yes, Tsunade replied. We would like to know more. He's tall. Six feet even. Reddish blonde hair, blue eyes. But when he uses his bloodline, they turn to gold. Likes to wear black, which earned him the nickname, The Man in Black. I fought alongside him in the Unification War, back when he was a teenager. You mean? Shikaku began. Maki nodded. He unified the lands and became emperor when he was fifteen years old. That was three years ago. Quite an amazing feat for a kid. Asana snorted at that, but kept silent. Danzu, on the other hand, was pretty impressed. Y-O-S-H. The emperor is truly a youthful opponent. Rock Lee shouted. To have unified the West in such a short time. Indeed, my most youthful student. Gai said. Gai sensei. Lee. Gai sensei. Lee. Gai sensei. Lee. Bunk. Bunk. Ten Ten brought the dreaded jutsu to a halt by knocking both men out. The shinobi side breathed a sigh of relief. Thank you, Ten Ten, Tsunade said, thus sparing the council, the dreaded flames of youth jutsu. Continue, Captain Asahina. He has that charisma, that strength. He can make you believe in him, Maki continued. He fights alongside his soldiers. Even when we were on campaign, he would do his share of the work around the camp, and still have time to conduct a war. He was trained in both the shinobi arts and the way of the samurai. I would die in a second for him. We all would. Loyalty, Inochi Yamanaka said. A powerful weapon for any leader to have. Maki nodded. Yes. He is loyal to his soldiers and to the people, and vice versa. What can you tell us about his armed forces? Danzu asked, getting a nasty glare from Tsunade. Sorry. I can't divulge that information. Will that be all, Lady Hokage? Tsunade nodded. Yes. You may go. Maki bowed and departed from the chambers. Once she was gone, another round of talks began. I say she is lying, Asana said. We should take her to Ibiki and see if he can loosen that tongue of hers. Danzu was thinking along the same lines. Only difference was that he was considering kidnapping Maki and converting her to his root. But he quickly dismissed that idea. If she was tough enough to have a bounty on her head, then sending root ANBU after her would be a bad idea. She was not lying, Inochi rebuked. I checked her mental patterns while we talked. She was very truthful and open. And from the look of things, she can still fight, even though she is no longer a ninja. We don't know what the ninja from the Western Empire are capable of. If the emperor himself is a skilled fighter, what does that say about his forces? Tsunade sighed. Inochi did have a point. As of this moment, the emperor is to be left alone. I will not have Kanoha wiped out over a misunderstanding. The council nodded. The Godame turned to the injured Uchiha. Uchiha. Get your injuries taken care of. 
This meeting is adjourned. Hyuga Compound, the following day. Hayashi and Hanabai Hyuga faced the Council of Elders. Hanabai was still bruised from her match with Maru Sarutobi, while Hayashi sported a fresh bruise from trying to attack the Emperor while in Suna, as well as an angry red handprint from where Karinai had slapped him. Both the clan head and his designated heir did not look very happy. The reason being was not that Hanabai had made the grade to Chinin, as she was defeated by Maru Sarutobi. The reason was that earlier that day, a courier ninja had dropped off Hanada Satai 8 and a scroll addressed to Hayashi and Hanabai. The scroll had all but verified it. Hanada had defected from the clan and the village. Hanada had disappeared the night before the emperor had fought Sasuke Uchiha in the finals. Hayashi had the main and branch clan members come Suna looking for her, but to no avail. Until that morning, when he received Hinata Satai 8 and the scroll. The scroll was simple and to the point, and it was from the Emperor of the West. To Lord Hayashi Hyuga and Hanabai Hyuga, heir apparent of the Hyuga clan. As of this moment, Hinata Hyuga has been granted political asylum. She is no longer a Chinin in the Kanahigakur Shinobi forces, nor is she no longer a citizen of Kanahigakur no Sado, as she is under my protection. I have personally removed the caged bird seal from her, thus freeing her from any and all obligations owed to the Hyuga clan. Sincerely, the Emperor of the Unified West. It was after he had received the letter that he tracked down Karinai Sarutobi. She was out with her husband and their daughter. As well as with the Inoshikacho trio. Flashback. Earlier that day. Hayashi, along with Hanabai found Karinai Sarutobi in the middle of lunch. Said Ninja was with her husband and daughter inside a restaurant. Also tagging along was Asuma's former students, Shikamaru Nara, Chuji Akamichi, and Ino Yamanaka. Do you know where my daughter is, Sarutobi? Hayashi demanded, his voice laced with anger. The patrons in the meantime had decided to clear out of the restaurant from the impending explosion that was soon to follow. Asuma had handed Hitomi to both Ino and Chuji and sent her outside as well. Karinai looked back at the arrogant clan head with no fear. Which daughter? The one you pushed aside and branded? Or your precious little heir? Hayashi's response to that was to slam down the scroll on the table. You know damn well which one I am talking about. Hinata was your responsibility during the Chinin exams. And you let her escape. Now Karinai was getting angry. Don't you blame this on me, Hyuga, the red-eyed Jinjutsu mistress shot back. Whose idea was it to send her to Suna so she could witness Hanabai's triumph? That was your idea, not mine. By the way, how did Hanabai do in the exams? I see that she is not wearing a chin and vest. Asuma, in the meantime, was reading the scroll, with Shikamaru looking over his shoulder. Is this for real? The chain-smoking clan had asked. Very, Hanabai replied. Just so you know, we are going to hold your wife responsible for this, Captain Sarutobi. My wife is not to blame, Asuma replied flatly. Your father was the ones who placed Hanada under virtual house arrest after branding her with that damned seal. And I have to agree with my wife. You sent her to Suna, and you underestimated her. Hanada is gone, and I hold you responsible, Hayashi sneered. I hope you're happy, Karinai Sarutobi. She is gone, to be a whore to that upstart of an emperor. Slap. In a flash, Karinai was standing in front of the Hyuga clan leader. Said leader now had a red handprint on his face. The end result of Karinai slapping him in full view of his daughter, Asuma, and Shikamaru. Hanabai rushed in to intervene, but was stopped in her tracks by Shikamaru's cage main. You are a damn fool. Hyuga, Karinai spat out. You placed that damned seal on her when she wasn't the perfect little heiress you wanted. Both the main and cadet branch treated her like garbage because of her support towards Naruto. At least with the emperor, she can be happy for once in her life. At the loss of face, both from his daughter leaving and being physically and verbally berated by the Jinjutsu master, Hayashi was ready to attack. However, a trench knife to the throat stayed his hand. He hadn't seen Asuma move that fast since, ever. 
touch my wife, Huga, assume a deadpan, and I'll gut you where you stand. Before a brawl could ensue, a squad of ANBU black ops, led by Kakashi, intervened. End flashback. In the end, Hayashi and Hanabi were reprimanded. Kurinai was cleared of any wrongdoing, but it was a bittersweet victory. Tsunade had to follow the rules of the Kanoha Charter and Hanada was placed in the bingo book as a A-ranked missing ninja with orders to retrieve on site. Now, the clan head and his heir was in a meeting with the Huga Council. This is most disturbing news, Hayashi, one of the council members said. Not only did Hanada had defected from the clan and from Kanoha, but the emperor was able to remove the caged bird seal. Impossible, a female Huga main branch member said. That seal was designed to be permanent. How can the emperor remove it? Either way. No one from the branch clan must not know about this, the first member said. If they find out that the caged bird seal can be removed, then we are looking at a civil war. I agree, Hanabi said. Hanada is gone, and the Baikagan is in the hands of the empire. That is unfortunate. But the emperor cannot protect Hanada all the time. She is as my father has told me, and it has already been proven, weak. All we have to do is bide our time. Hinata will return to the east. And when she does, we will strike. Furthermore, if it pleases my father and the Honorable Huga Council, I propose an incentive to get Hinata back. Such as, a third council member asked. A bounty contract on Hinata, Hanabi replied. 20 million Rio, to anyone who brings Hinata back alive, to face justice. A reasonable incentive, Hayashi said. After talking it over, the three council members turned to Hayashi and Hanabi. Your proposal is acceptable. Make it so. Several hours later. Shikamaru Nara was currently enjoying his favorite pastime, cloud watching. Or at least he was when the form of Sasuke Uchiha blocked out the clouds and the sun. So is it true then? Shikamaru asked, not moving from his perch. The man in black is the emperor? It is, the Uchiha replied. This complicates things. What do you want with me? A word, with you and your father, Sasuke said before walking off in the direction of the Nara home. The lazy chin and groaned. Damn. This is very troublesome. Nara Ranch, later on. Shikaka Nara played host to Sasuke Uchiha. The clan head slash deer herder and his heir sat at a table with the Uchiha. Yoshino had served the three men drinks, stopping only to give her husband and the last Uchiha a nasty look each before retreating into the kitchen. Apparently, even the hot-headed wife of Shikaku disliked playing hostess to even Sasuke Uchiha. To what we owe the honor of your visit, Sasuke Uchiha? Shikaku asked as he took a sip of his tea. The Emperor of the West, Sasuke replied. We all fought against him. We all lost. You want to trade notes, Shikaku surmised. Not much to tell about him, only that for a kid, he's pretty damn tough. I always thought that he would be older. But still, to unify the West in only two years, very impressive. Fighting-wise, we got off light. Can't say the same for Hitaki, the Inazuka, and the Hyuga. He's a hard person to analyze, his fighting style ranging from direct and brutal to smooth and fluid. I saw that as well, Sasuke said. His taijutsu and ninjutsu are top-notch. Add the fact that his bloodline pretty much blocks the Sharingan's ability to copy jutsu, he is indeed a formidable fighter. Given his skills and abilities, Shikamaru began. He could easily make SS ranking in the bingo book. Danzu's taken an interest in him. Pretty obvious, Sasuke said. I think he's given up on me joining his side. But you got to admit that it's strange. The emperor knew exactly how to fight each and every one of us. He knew our strengths and our weaknesses and exploited them to his advantage. He broke your cage mane before Ino could possess him with her mind jutsu, and repeated the feat with your father. He knew how to counter and exploit the weakness of the Huga's Jukun. Rock Lee respects him, despite losing to him. As does Guy. 
Ten Ten is pretty much obsessed with that sort of his. But that beatdown he gave to the Inazuka and Captain Hitaki. Shikaku shuddered. Very troublesome. Sasuke nodded. Indeed. And look what happened to Hitaki. And he and his elite guards took apart Danzu and his route, as well as two separate squads of ANBU Black Ops. Captain Midarashi wants a rematch against him. There's a lot more to this guy than he appears. You think that, wouldn't you? Shikaku responded. Hataki may have been an idiot for a sensei, but he did teach one valuable lesson. Look underneath the underneath, the Echiha replied. Gara seems to know him. Why else would he attend the Suna exams? You're thinking that he could be allied with Suna? Shikamaru asked. Sasuke shrugged his shoulders. Could be. I noticed an imperial consulate in the city. And Gara was more than willing to allow the emperor and myself to fight in the Suna arena once the tournament was completed. So yeah, an alliance with Suna is pretty feasible. Hard to believe that he unified the West while most of us made Chinin, Shikamaru drawled. And he survived a confrontation with Itachi and his shark-faced buddy, a feat in itself. And the fact that he has intercepted most of the Jinchuriki from the Akatsuki. Sasuke trailed off. Do you think that he can be among them? Shikaku and Shikamaru stiffened slightly. They knew that Sasuke was talking about Naruto. While the remaining members of Cell 7 were indifferent in regards to his banishment, Sasuke showed general remorse in seeing his former teammate banished. Shikamaru had even overheard him at his cousin Abito's grave one day. Saying that Naruto may have been a knucklehead and a deadlast, but he was loyal and that the council should not have banished him. But ever since Sasuke had released the details of the planned Uchiha revolt, as well as of the circumstances of the Nine Tails attack on Kanoha, he has gained even more of the shinobi population's mistrust. The civilian council continued to kiss his ass. Sasuke downed the rest of the tea and placed the cup back on the tray. Either way, I hope he is still alive and happy, regardless of his banishment. Thank you for your time, Lord Nara, Shikamaru. I think I can find my way out. Once Sasuke was gone, Shikaku looked pensive for the first time in a while. So what do you think? he asked Shikamaru. Uchiha has a point, Shikamaru said. Deception's always been part of our way of life. The emperor is a wild card at best. A highly skilled wild card, but a wild card, nonetheless. Despite everything that has happened, he did save Asuma Sensei from Haydn. Shikaku wasn't convinced. What do you really think, son? Now that Sasuke was gone, Shikamaru could speak freely. That the emperor could have spies and informants in the east. Maybe inside the fire capital, or even Kanoha. Worst case scenario is that the emperor is connected to Kanoha in some way, and knows how each of us fight, and counter our signature techniques. And the way he had beaten down Niji and Lord Huga, not to mention how he brutally beaten Captain Hitaki, the Inazuka matriarch in Kiba, shows that those five had slighted him in some way. Everyone else just got lucky. And the emperor has been intercepting the Jinchuriki, Sasuke did make a valid point. Uzumaki could be among them. You still think that he is the Nine Tails Reborn? Shikamaru thought about it for a moment. When he was banished, yes. But now that I think about it, if he was the QB, then he would have long since raised this place to the ground. I think he really is the jailer. But more importantly, he will probably never forgive us for favoring Uchiha over him. The elder Nara nodded. He then made a decision. Shikamaru, what I am about to tell you must not be uttered outside these walls. No one, not even Asuma, or Chuji, or Ino, or the Hokage herself must not know. Promise me. Shikamaru nodded. Is this a troublesome secret? Troublesome, does not even begin to describe it, Shikaku replied. It concerns the circumstances of Uzumaki's banishment. Swear it to me, on your honor, as a member of the Nara clan. Shikamaru sighed. I swear on the honor of the Nara clan. I will tell no one. And Shikaku told him. Once he was finished, he stood up. 
feel free to throw up. I know I did. Once Shikaku was out of the room, that was what Shikamaru had did. He made a beeline to the bathroom and emptied the contents of his stomach. His dad was right. Troublesome did not even begin to describe what has happened to Uzumaki. My God, what have we done, was the last thought that Shikamaru had before he puked again. Thanks for watching, please like share and subscribe.